Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles talk show podcast called Things We Said Today. This is, under normal circumstances, a show that we do bi-weekly, every two weeks, and we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Beatles. Their years together, their solo years, their history, their music, what's going on in the news, maybe sometimes what may be happening in the future. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. Hopefully you're familiar with my syndicated radio show on the Beatles called Every Little Thing. I also co-host another uh, Beatles talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. That's also a bi-weekly show. And I have my own Beatles YouTube channel called Ken Michaels Radio. And we're doing a special show this time because, well, they're all special. But this is the very first show that we're doing, believe it or not, for 2024. Spect, many of you have wondered <laughs> where we've been. Well, <laughs> New Zealand. Uh, it just so happens that our own Alan Cozen and um, his collaborator on the McCarty Legacy, Adrian Sinclair, have been very busy working on volume two of the series, and they needed the entire month of January and a little bit longer uh, to not only write volume two of the series, but also to edit it. And Darren and I did not want to interfere in the process at all. We wanted to give Alan and Adrian their space. And that's why we haven't had a show for the entire month of January and now going into, well, almost the end of February. So we're glad to be back. I want to welcome my two regular co-hosts. And we have two very special guests to join us on the show this time out. Uh, first of all, a man who just, was it today or yesterday? celebrated his 40th anniversary in radio yesterday okay on uh new york's wfuv quite a milestone there's no doubt about it and as i've said many times to be on the same radio station is practically unheard of in this day and age uh darren devivo welcome howdy thank you ken appreciate it and it, it has been i can't believe it's been 40 years um uh, there was technically, I think, like maybe a couple of months in that 40-year span where I, I guess, wasn't part of the staff, but I hadn't ventured terribly far away. So opportunity um, struck again. And when people ask me, uh, you know, how did it end up happening? I tell them, you need to have talent. You need to have that core. You also need to be lucky and you need to have time on your side. Mm -hmm. And timing was a lot of a lot of what worked for me, and um, so 40 years later, here I be, and uh, hopefully for another 40 years. Okay, oh, at least. Which, uh, 50, that put me into triple digits, but um, that's fine <laughs> with me. So, if I know you, you'll still be on the radio. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and Alan Cozen, of course, is with us. You know him as being... Uh, half of the collaboration with Adrian Sinclair, as I mentioned before, of the McCartney Legacy Volume 1, soon to be Volume 2. He has also written Got That Something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, a very timely book, I should say, to go with our conversation today, and a book that actually should be reissued now because of the anniversary of the Beatles' arrival in America. And also, he has written The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, many years working for the New York Times in their classical department. Always a joy to have him on the show. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. Hello, Darren. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Is there any chance, since I just mentioned that, that the book is going to be reissued? It seems like the timing <laughs> couldn't be more perfect for a book like that. Um, don't know. You know, you have a point. Um, the... The, the the book was published by a collaboration of the of New York Times books and um, I think a company called Byliner and Byliner went out of business so um, I should I should hit up my editor at the Times about doing something with it because it's it's not a bad little book and it's just sort of sitting there out in the ether that you know no one can get so, mm. good point let's hope it comes back. Also, we bring back to the show Al Sussman, who for several years was actually a co-host on Things We Said Today. Goes all the way back to the beginning of Beatle Fan Magazine. He's been a contributing editor, senior editor, 
for a Beatle fan, and also the author of the book Change in Times, 101 Days That Shaped a Generation. Always good to have him aboard. Hi, Al. Hi, Ken. How are you? And Darren, Alan, and uh, Mr. the other mystery guest. <laughs> How are you all? Good, good. Great to see you, Al. I can't Thanks. imagine. Congratulations, Darren. Thank you, Al. Thank you. I can't imagine our other guest being a mystery to any Beatle fan because he's written so many Beatle books, all the best of quality. And um, in fact, one of them, it's the perfect title for our show, The Beatles Are Coming, The Birth of Beatlemania in America is one of them. He's put out a series of books to time with the archival box sets that have come out from Sgt. Pepper to the White Album, Let It Be, Magical Mystery Tour on Yellow Submarine, although those that haven't come out in box sets. And um, also a new one, well, the most recent one, Please Please Me to With the Beatles. And he's done books on the Beatles on VJ, uh, the Beatles Swan Song, the Beatles on Swan Records. The Beatles story on Capitol Records, two volumes. And he's still working on more Beatle books, we're glad to say. Bruce Spicer, welcome to Things We Said Today. What a pleasure to be around and chat Beatles with people who know their stuff. So this should be a lot of fun. Um, a lot of those books, you know, really talk of, you know, have a lot of tie into that 60th anniversary, certainly. And, uh, you know, back in the day, 25, six, seven years ago, whatever, when I started that VJ book, it was going to be a little footnote in Beatles history by an attorney, and that was going to be it. And mm -hmm. the VJ book came out, people enjoyed it, and they said, when's the Capitol book coming out? And even before the Capitol books came out, people were like, well, my favorite records are the ones on Apple. And you kind of got the idea, and that morphed into a whole series. And And then I retired from Beatle writing for a while, and for the 50th anniversary of Sgt. Pepper, I had that little book uh, on Sgt. Pepper. It wasn't going to be an album series until that book came out and people were like, well, Bruce, you have to do a book on the White Album and you get the idea. So that's where we're going. And the most recent book that's out now does tie in, of course, with the 60th anniversary, The Beatles' Please Please Me to With The Beatles, which covers, of course, those British albums and associated and before singles but also the U.S. albums introducing the Beatles and Meet the Beatles. And, you know, obviously that ties in well. And Al Sussman was a big contributor to that book and all the books in the Beatles album series. Right. I was just about to say that. Mm -hmm. Along with Al, you've had Pierce Hemmingson, mm -hmm. Beatles in Canada, uh, Bill King, of course, yeah. the, the publisher for Beatle fan, Frank Daniels. Whole mess of good people contributing to your series of books from Sgt. Pepper on for the for the box sets time. You know, I mean, the idea was uh, I got a little help from my friends on the first one and decided to keep doing that. And I'm really proud to say that I'm now working on the eighth book in the series, which is almost done in the same core group of contributors that you've named have contributed to that book. And that book will be called The Beatles, A Hard Day's Night and More. In the and more, well, there was a lot going on, not so much in the UK, but in the US, as far as record releases coming fast and furious from as soon as the Beatles got on that airplane heading back to the UK till all the way till, um, you know, that following Thanksgiving. There's just a ton of stuff going on in the US that I felt needed to be covered. So that's where it stops in the book? You don't cover, say, Beatles for Sale or... No, that'll be the last book in the series. The last book, this the last book in the series will be called Beatles for Sale to Help. And that will be the last book in the album series. Okay, very good. Um, I should point out that uh for those of you that look forward to the news segment of the show, and it's always been a very big part of the show and very popular for this particular show. We're focusing on the 60th anniversary of the Beatles' arrival in America. We just want to concentrate on the interview with Al and with Bruce. But uh, so much has happened since our last show. And we're going to record another show later this week. And we're going to give you all a ton of news of what's transpired in January and February. And there's news every single day that I keep on adding to the list. It's so incredible. I was just telling Alan right before the show... Um, there's going to be a 60th anniversary for John Lennon's book in his own right. 
at the Beatles Museum in Liverpool. Just found that out. And were you going to say something, Alan? Yeah, plus we have the show that we did um, the, our live panel from the fest. Right. We have the video of that, and, and that's actually all edited and ready to go. Um, so some, sometime after the new show, we'll have that one too. So we'll have three shows in quick succession, and we'll teach you to miss us. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you, I hope you enjoyed your break from us because we're coming at you now. We're going to be, we're going to be, you're going to hear our voices in your head when you're in bed at night. It's a scary terrifying. thought. It's a terrifying <laughs> thought. <laughs> so uh, we're planning on recording a, a show on the news Friday this week, and hopefully it'll be out the end of this week or next Monday, but you'll certainly be catching up on all the news. So we promise you that coming very soon. Before we talk about the 60th anniversary, we just had a major event in New York City to celebrate the 60th anniversary. And that was at the Fest for Beatle fans at the TWA Hotel at JFK Airport. And all five of us happened to be there. And I do want to take this time to thank everyone that came up to the panels I was on for things we said today. And we had, like Alan said, the panel with Alan and Adrian Sinclair, who was there. We talked about um, uh, locations where Wings recorded in the 70s. That was Darren's idea. And we also had a Talk More Talk and Two Legs panel as well. Thanks to all of you who came by to say hello to all of us. It meant so much to all of us. And nice to see you all in the flesh <laughs> instead of just seeing your names out there on uh, on our YouTube channel and, uh, and all of our podcast shows on audio. But uh, I thought that we'd all talk briefly about what the fest was like for you this year. And especially since it's a special area being where the Beatles landed. Uh, what that meant to you, and uh, you know, what were some some of the highlights for you? Let's start with Al. Uh, well, actually, there's not a lot to tell uh, because uh, that was actually my uh, that was my last fest. Um, I had actually told Mark last spring that uh, that I was set to uh, retire from uh, uh, working on the fest staff and. Uh, he insisted that I had to be at the 50th. So, uh, so I was there. The, I guess probably the main highlight for me was uh, I uh, put together a panel on Saturday morning, of, in, which included Bruce, as a matter of fact, of fans from, um, from 1964. Um, and... Um, uh, with uh, let's see, um, well, several, several fans, including including Bruce and Pierce Hemmingson, and um, and lovely uh, ladies. I'm sorry, some lovely ladies were on yes, that panel. Yes, too. indeed, exactly, and uh, you know, names. <laughs> one of the reasons why I'm retiring is that names go flying off into the. Uh, into the into the mists of time <laughs> they come back but uh anyway uh and the only other and uh, um basically the only other thing that happened to me at the fest was i sprained my shoulder on saturday evening and uh, pretty much was out of commission on sunday and that was it so uh um it wasn't the way i would have liked to uh have uh, have gone out but uh that's it so, Al, you won't attend as a fan? No. Oh. No, nope, I'm done. And that goes for the Chicago Fest coming up this year? Yeah, oh, definitely. Okay. Definitely. In, fa in fact, we're, um, uh, we're planning actually on going to New Orleans in, uh, in the fall. And that uh, pretty much um, eliminates any, uh, any Chicago trip. So, uh, no, nope, um, that, that was it. Well, we're sorry to hear that you won't be attending the fest, but you always know you have a home here. Absolutely. And on my channel and all the other podcasts that I'm on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Bruce, what would you like to say about the fest? Well, I certainly enjoyed the panel that Al did. And um, the highlight for me, though, was I like to turn something that was really horrible into something good. And in my case... I had a streak going, kind of like Darren's, 
for 40 years in a row on the Friday before Mardi Gras, I rode in the crew of Hermes and tossed beads into the crowd with my friends. And this year, unfortunately, because the fest was moved to early February for the 60th anniversary, for the first time, the fest and the Friday before Mardi Gras coincided. So I was not able to do what I normally do, or so I thought. I got the idea that I needed to do that anyway. So what I did was I decided that I would come on stage at precisely 7.07, I picked that time because the Beatles arrived in America on a Boeing 707, and it was at the end of a panel that was being expertly moderated, and the moderator was good enough to save those eight minutes for me, and I showed up in full costume, and that included mask and everything. And I got up there, and I said, you know, we're here to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Ed Sullivan Show, which 60 years ago tonight was being watched. And 73 million people tuned in, and here's why. And I gave a kind of a five-minute or so summary on how Beatlemania exploded in America. And then I passed out packets of beads to everyone else on the panel, and we threw beads into the crowd. So I got to do what I would normally do. That was a lot of fun. Uh, the TWA Hotel was a mixed bag. It was cool. It was dated like you were back in 1962. And that aspect of it was great. The logistics for a convention weren't so hot. I did enjoy walking around the uh, Constellation prop plane that was outside. There's a bar inside of there, but it's also hot in there. So I think the idea is walk around and look at the plane as opposed to having a drink inside. Uh, You know, but those types of things. I always enjoyed being with my friends. Uh, I was in a room. They put the offers in separate rooms because it's kind of a weird layout. So I was in kind of like a glass wall fishbowl, but I was with David Bedford and Pierce Hemmingson. So those were two pretty good guys to be stuck with. And in that aspect of it, the guests were always cool. And I got to hear the music, which was great. I got to hear, you know, the weaklings, the magical mystery girls, the black ties and all things like that. So that was kind of neat. Um, Usually I don't get to hear the music where I was. So, you know, I call it a one and done venue, but I thought the good outweighed the bad for me, certainly. And anytime you get together with your Beatle friends, that's going to be a good weekend, regardless of the logistics. You can forget about the fact that the food court ran out of hot dogs and all that other stuff. (laughs) And it took me three times to get them to prepare a cheeseburger plain, which I had ordered and things like that. You forget all that. And you focus on the fun stuff. Mm. Okay. So I was glad. I was glad I went. Okay. Some things that you said I'm going to bounce off of a little bit later, but I want to hear um, Alan's opinion of the fest. Had a good time. Um, a lot of the time, I was you know sitting at the table with the books and Adrian, and you know signing them or selling them or whatever. And um, but. Um, we had um, we had just finished volume two the Friday before and submitted it. So we were both, I think, on a little bit of a high from that. You know, I mean, there's, it's it's a lot of lot of work. It's like it's like carrying something really heavy, and when you put it down, you feel like wow, you know. <laughs> um, but um, you know, also at our panel that we did the things we said today panel our editor and publisher turned up so when you guys said so is there a publishing date we could look at her and uh now we have a publishing date which is um at the moment is scheduled for december 10th so don't buy all your christmas gifts early wait until the 10th (laughs) Um, and uh she um yeah, we had we had some good news from her that um, volume one is in the black, so the publisher is happy with it. And um, you know the story I always tell about how when she first asked how many volumes, and I said five, that she you know had such a look of horror that I said um, I mean four. Um, 
This time, now that volume one's done so well, uh, after our panel, we were sitting at the table talking and she said, so do you guys think you can do five? And uh, hey, yeah. So that now helps us a bit with the timing because um, as you know, volume one was only 1969 to 73 and it was 720 pages. Volume two is 74 to early in 1980 and it's a little bit longer. It's maybe 20,000 words longer, even after we did all the cutting. Mm. Um, uh, so it, 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 we, we've been wondering, okay, if we only have two more volumes to get from 1980 to the present, how are we gonna do that and maintain the kind of detail for which we've become famous and excoriated in some corners, but, that's what we wanted to do, and we did it. So, scoriate us. I don't care. Anyway, <laughs> um, now what we'll be able to do is volume three will be the 80s. So, it's a longer period than we have for the first two volumes, but it's shorter than it was going to be because volume three was going to have to go from 1980 to like Linda's death in 1998. And now we can go from 80 to 89. And then the next one will go from, you know, 89 to 2000. And then if there's a fifth volume, it will be 2000 to the present. But maybe maybe the first four will have done so well that she'll say, do you think you can do six? You know? <laughs> we'll see. Oh. But, you know, I enjoyed being on, on the panels. We did, uh, apart from ours, um, I did a collector's panel, which, you know, wasn't what we... <laughs> expected because they were supposed to have AV facilities. And I had made a PowerPoint show with a bunch of things that I didn't want to actually physically bring with me, um, but, you know, wanted to show. And uh, since there was no AV, we never really got to show them. We just, we just had a talk about aspects of collecting. Um, supposedly the, uh, <clears throat> supposedly the hotel reneged on, providing uh av equipment yeah that's a pity um but a pity but you know because we had sort of a general discussion it went in places that i wouldn't have expected and i found out one very useful thing i am apparently not the only nutcase on the planet who has a few boxes full of empty long boxes from the early days of CDs. Um, <laughs> someone was talking about them and asked people in the room who kept the long boxes to raise their hands, and pretty much everyone did. That's so I suddenly felt less alone. Um, <laughs> I have them. Yeah, yeah. I guess it's not so crazy, you know? I mean, I, I sort of like, it's one of those things that I never really, you know, would admit to having, you know, kept, but I've kept them. I like the packaging. Yeah. I used to it was I done. Cut I mean, me to, go ahead. Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah. Do your, for the younger viewers who don't remember these long boxes, mm. they were done so they could fit in record bins, right. which accommodated 12-inch albums. And so rather than having people do bins that would accommodate shorter CDs, they put them in these long boxes. And uh, most people would get the long boxes and throw them away. But blows with collector mentality saved them. I don't necessarily think they're worth a lot of money, but, um, you know, they're there. I think they also felt that CDs would be easier. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. steel if they were in a, a exactly. Yeah. high box. Exactly. Box. Yeah. Six. Just need a bigger code. Yeah. <laughs> I did catch a cold at Fest. Um, I still have two weeks later, um, but it tested negative for COVID. Um, and the the other thing we did, I mean, we Adrian and I were both interviewed by Wally Pedrazic, which is always a thrill because, mm -hmm. you know, all of us know Wally. And um, I was just listening to a podcast that Mark Lewison did um, uh, with the British um, uh, Beatles Books podcast, Joe Wisby. Um, and he talks about, you know, the, Wally's book being really the first serious discography of the Beatles that he read as a kid. Um, and, you know, I think, I don't know if Wally gets enough credit these days because it was so long ago and I wish he was still mm. Beatles books, you know, but, um, 
but but that book and the other two that that came after it were were you know really great books. So it was it's always fun being interviewed by Wally. And then the last thing uh, was uh, Adrian and I both interviewed Lawrence Juber and Steve Holly at uh, at. At, that was one panel too. And that was a lot of fun because um, we had interviewed them separately um, for the book. I had interviewed Steve and uh, Adrian had interviewed Lawrence. And so interviewing them together was kind of interesting because we, we were both familiar with each other's interviews um, and we were able to get them to tell a lot of the uh, more interesting stories that they had told us and in some case expanded on them, um, which will mean that we'll have to add some new little bits to the, to the book. So, uh, so that was great, you know, and, and, you know, also, you know, like Al said, and, 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 and Bruce, just seeing, you know, people that we know from online or people that we might've met 20 years ago or done a trade with or whatever, um, people who listen to this show and write comments, um, in, in the, the YouTube uh comment section and uh you know it's 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 really great being able to put a face you know with the name um or a real name with the screen name <laughs> so yeah it was fun yeah you're gonna have to put out revised editions of your books as you add a little bit more each time right. kind of like what paul just did with his lyrics book <laughs> seven songs added for the new version you know? <laughs> right. darren how about you I have my souvenir TWA hotel pencil. Um, <clears throat> I had a great time. <clears throat> I was um, sort of familiar with the TWA hotel before the fest, having really, I've <laughs> having only been in the lobby once. Um, uh, I dropped off my daughter was spent a weekend there with some friends of hers as kind of like a home base for a weekend of going into the into New York City. And my wife has been to many functions there. In fact, um, the college that she works at will be having their gala uh, in what was the ballroom in April. Um, so uh, whether or not <laughs> whether or not I'll be there, that's another story for another day. But I enjoyed the hotel, even though I understood, I understand all the complaints about it. What I wasn't crazy about, and this could have been avoided, was that I went in thinking and having heard from several people that it's a small hotel. No, it's not. It, 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 it might have be limited in um, space for a conference or something like the Fest, which I think they ended up doing a nice job fitting it in there. But it was very spread out, very confusing. Signage was awful. And I don't know how many times mm. I felt like I was in Spinal Tap where I was walking around looking for the backstage door and I'd come out of the elevator and be right back where I started 10 minutes earlier and yeah. not know how that happened. And I must have, there was, I'm sure there were several times where I just looked like a lost puppy walking around thinking they told me the fourth floor I'm on the fourth floor. Nothing is familiar. Oh, you're on the wrong side of the building. I didn't know there was another side of the building. Then when I thought I mastered it, I'd get lost again. Yep. You know, The mistake you made was airplanes have two wings. So the hotel had two wings. Mm. Once I figured that out, I was trying to explain to my friends who were there um, about the different wings. And it was... It was very confusing, but yet still at the same time, I don't know. There was something I really enjoyed about it. Um, I sure as heck got a lot of exercise in. Um, <laughs> I looked on my cell phone uh, when I got home on Sunday night, and the amount of steps that I took Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I don't recall what my wife and I figured out, but it was more walking than I did in several months before that. Um, so I did think, okay, I got some exercise in, um, trying to find my room, trying to find the restaurant, thinking I was on the first floor when I was on the third floor. Um, and by the time I figured it all out, it was time to check out and go home. But, um, I enjoyed it. 
I enjoyed it, even with the shortcomings. Um, and there were some. Um, I wouldn't mind if there's another fest there. I don't see it really happening. It doesn't have to happen there anymore. This was for a special occasion. In fact, just to get off track for those who are, who are watching this, who come to the fest in New York, New Jersey, the old, our old home in Secaucus uh, is actually being renovated and will be reopening as a hotel at some time in the near future. Now, I'm not saying anything except that that's happening. Um, some company. Are, I think they're talking 2030. Is it that far? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. I know that this. It would take them that long to get the elevators to work. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I know the city of Secaucus always wanted it, if it was not going to be knocked down, which I don't think was ever an option, wanted it to be a hotel. There had been talk about turning that building into apartments. Um, but mm -hmm. now a company has taken over. And, uh, and renovating it to be reopened as a hotel. Anyway, back to this year's fest. I had a great time, um, and it, it started off rather eventful with our Friday night Meet the Special Guest panel, and Bruce was alluding to um, his appearance in his, in his uh, Mardi Gras ga garb. Uh, well, that was me he grabbed beforehand and said, 707, I'm going to come on up. Great. I get up on the stage and realize I have no access to a clock. Yeah, you were a great sport for allowing me to to do that. And I was really pleased that you were moderating that panel. And and I, as far as I could tell, everyone really got into it, enjoyed tossing the beads out. Well, thank you for wearing a lot of lights and headlights and stuff on the outfit, because not having access to a clock, I didn't know what seven, when it was 7.07. I'm looking at the timer that they have on the stage about how long the 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 whole the whole segment was supposed to run, and as it ran out, I wrapped up and on cue, I see somebody well illuminated backstage, and I was like, okay, I did it. I got to the point. There's Bruce, hand it off to him. Uh, that was a thrill, though, getting to sit down on the stage next to Mickey Dolans and talk to Fr Frida Kelly. And and Lawrence Juber and Greg Bissonette and um, help me here. Um, Gary Burr? Oh no, Gary, no, Gary wasn't there on Friday night. It was uh, Mickey Dolan's Billy J. Kramer with yep. Greg, Greg Bissonette, um, Jennifer Boyd, um, Frida Kelly, um, Lawrence Juber. I mentioned Greg Bissonette, right? Yeah, uh, Chris O'Dell. And the very, very charming Julie Evans, who was the rock star of the weekend. I absolutely fell in love with Julie. She was great. Uh, Mal Evans' daughter. Uh, she was basically pressed into action because her brother, Gary, who's been doing uh, the publicity with Ken Womack over his dad's book and Julie's dad's book, Mal, Mal Evans, Gary was unavailable. I think he had um, was having... Um, uh, um, some uh, elective surgery, minor surgery, I, uh, cataracts, I believe. So Julie found herself thrust into the spotlight of representing her dad, Mal Evans. And um, I know it was a little deer in the headlights situation for her at first, but I mean, she was absolutely extraordinary. And, um, and besides the meet the special guests on Friday night, uh, then I got to interview my good friend, Steve Matteo, uh, who we had on things we said today, late last year. And we talked about his book act naturally. Right and when, when Steve and I are together, it's always great. He's been up to FUV when his let it be book was published, uh, which is about 20 years, give or take now. Um, and we've been friends through the years. Um, there is a, uh, concert, uh, a concert film of the Doobie Brothers at the Beacon Theater from several years ago, um, where they performed uh, two of their albums in its entirety. And, and Steve and I were at that show, and there's a split second where you see us in the audience at the, in the, at the Beacon Theater. So Steve and I go back, and it was great to catch up with him. Maybe the highlight for me panel-wise was getting to sit with, uh, with Alan and Adrian and Ken and talk about Wings and the unique recording locations that they chose to work in uh in the 70s 
Um, and that was the one that our good friend uh, Andy Nichols uh, filmed for us so that we're going to be able to use that here as a future show. Andy Nichols from Two Legs. Uh, and I know he does another, at least one other podcast. Um, and yeah. then it was Sunday. Uh, we had the media panel, which is a Sunday tradition. And then another highlight was getting to spend time with the great Jay Bergen, uh, John Lennon's lawyer um, and the author of, I don't remember the full title. What is it? Lennon? The lawyer. The lawyer and the... Uh, and the mobster. The mobster. And uh, that almost didn't happen because Jay had an accident in the hotel. Right. And Jay, though, was, you know, he was made out of rubber. He bounced right back and he was mm. there. We had a great session that ended just as the Super Bowl began um, on Sunday night. Now, the crowd was cut down. I think it was, was a pretty, pretty significantly cut down on Sunday due to the Super Bowl. Uh, but we, uh, Jay and I had the, our, the uh, panel room filled. Um, great. so that was great. And, you know, getting to hang out and meet, uh, meet all of you who watch and listen to us here. Um, and some WFUV listeners who I bump into from time to time every year at the fest. Um, I hung out for a little while with, uh, uh, Madeline Baccaro who wrote uh, the Yoko Ono book and, uh, hung with Steve Matteo and uh, with Jude Sutherland Kessler. And it was just a great weekend. And, you know, I went home to catch some of the Super Bowl at home and was driving uh, during the first half of the game. And immediately I had the kind of, oh, it's over. Oh, I can't wait until next year. Mm. And there was there was a little bit of a, feeling and maybe it was indigestion on my part that this might have been the last fest but i kept getting reassured there will be a 2025 um so um looking forward to that counting the days to whenever that happens but it was a great weekend and uh, again hi to those of you it was great to meet those of you who watch us here and listen here in person all right great darren um, as for me, I had a tremendous time. I always say that the activities at the fest can't be beat once you add all the guests who were there. And I happen to love the panel discussions. And they had one room there, the paperback writer room, which is where we did the things we said today and talk more talk two legs panel. Um, I could spend the entire day in there and not leave my seat <laughs> because yeah. I'm captivated by all the discussions, even ones that I thought I wouldn't be. I mean, there was one that Sarah Schmidt did, all about Beatles fan clubs, how it all was started. Something I never really delved into, but I found all that pretty fascinating. I loved all the different discussions, all the panels that I got to witness. I was on the one for things we said today, the Talk More Talk Two Legs one. I was on the media panel, um, and Wally Pedrazic does an excellent job every single year about that. He always comes up with different questions every single year and it's kind of important mm -hmm. to have a panel like that because you know the podcast world is growing and growing in leaps and bounds and to compare that to people like darren and myself who have the radio background too uh what the difference is between the past the present what matters in a podcast what's good about podcasts what's not so good about podcasts i love talking about that stuff and um and I love the performances that I got to see in the main ballroom, especially the weaklings who just sound better and better every time I see them. There's a band that's been around for over 10 years that I'm sorry to say never got to see cellophane flowers. And I thought they were fantastic. It's, it's basically um, the lead singer with an acoustic guitar being set to an orchestra. Like Great. I think six musicians playing strings and it was fantastic it just completely blew me away having all the guests that darren mentioned how can you beat all those people it's so important to have people like billy j kramer or often you get peter asher there people from the 60s from that time sadly there's a lot of people that have passed away we got to cling on to <clears throat> people like billy and peter and now Frida kelly 
who was always a joy. You know, she was right in the thick of it, running the fan club and all. Uh, ha having all those great people, Greg Bissonette, who is nothing but bursting with enthusiasm to the point where he can tire you out. And he does his own little drum clinics where he plays Ringo's drum fills and other famous drum parts. Um, it, it's amazing. Uh, I loved everything from, from the whole weekend. But the hotel was a problem. Yes, mm. it, um, it had so much about the 60s there. There was a room where you could play Twister if you wanted to. They had a, a like a mock-up hair salon with the old, what do you call them, that you put over a woman's head? Hair, hair, dry hair dryers. Hair dryer. Mm. But I, I enjoyed seeing all that stuff. But it wasn't conducive to elderly people or people who have trouble walking. And, uh, you know, my wife mm -hmm. has trouble. Uh, and she had to have um, a walker with her to get from one part of, uh, from say our room to any location. It was it really was confusing, as Darren. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, when you walk in there at the entrance, when you check in, that's the fourth floor. <laughs> yeah. How does a hotel start on the fourth floor? But almost everything was either on the fourth floor or the first floor, and. Um, but there was so much walking, not enough elevators, very tiring. Um, and even, you know, I was lucky by the end of the weekend if I understood how to get from one place to the other. Um, I would not want to see us do another fest there. I think this was a one-time thing. But, like I said, the activities there couldn't be beat, you know. Um, I've always said my biggest problem with the fest is that there's so many things going on simultaneously that you want to see and you can't see all of them and you have to pick which ones are the most important and very very often you're involved with one of them. You know, one of the panels I was on was opposite Mickey Dolan's in the ballroom and it's, you know, I would I personally would prefer to, <laughs> to see Mickey Dolan's talk, uh but there's so much going on all at the same time and you really can't get to do everything you want to do. But um, still, I had a great time. I mean, and following up, like I said before, it was a rare thing where I actually got to hear the music or hear some of the interviews because of where my thing was located. And it brought memories to me, horrific memories of one time I was at Abbey Road on the river and I was next to the karaoke stage. Uh -huh. and that, was, <laughs> that was a nightmare. And I learned that the two most horrific words in karaoke or when someone who has no talent walks up to a mic and goes, hey, Jude, and you know you're stuck for seven minutes. Okay. But no, I enjoyed that aspect. And I had a little bit of pre-fest fun in that uh, I was interviewed for CBS Mornings by Major Garrett, who wanted to do an interview on the 60th anniversary of the Washington Coliseum concert. Uh -huh. And it worked out really well. Um, you know, basically, I got there a little bit early. They were still setting up. And uh, the producer introduced me to him and he and I just sat down and talked Beatles. And then they put mics on us and said, keep doing what you're doing. And it was a lot of fun. And what I learned was the other person they featured in the story was someone who had attended the concert. And that was Al Gore. So I thought that was kind of cool. Nice. Wow. Is that online to watch? I don't know if it <laughs> still is or not. It CBS is. may have YouTube. taken it down, but uh, it was online on for a little bit. If you, know? you uh, if, on YouTube, do a search for CBS Mornings. Uh, what date did it, uh, did it run? Was it on? Uh, I don't know, I think was on the it 16th. on? Was it? Hmm? I think it ran the Friday following Friday. So that okay, I guess the sixteenth. The sixteenth. Okay. Yeah, do a search there. CBS Mornings, February sixteenth, twenty twenty four, and uh, either that or CBS Mornings <laughs> Al Gore, and uh, that'll probably pop up. Yeah, now, I, for some strange reason, Al Gore is better known than I am. I, I can't yeah. imagine why. <laughs> um, Ken Womack, our colleague, was actually on Morning Joe on MSNBC. Yes. On was it? It's the Friday or the Saturday of that weekend, and I didn't know about it. It was I, that Friday. Okay, so good for him to talk about mm -hmm. his anniversary. I did ask him, "Could you get a word in about Mel Evans?" He wasn't able to do that. Yeah. He, yeah, TV. Uh, the stories, you know, you know, it's it's unlike a podcast where we could talk for hours tonight. Whereas on that, you know, they're they're very limited, and uh, it goes by so quick that 
you know, people said you get nervous and you're like, you don't have time to get nervous. It's over before you, you know what's happening. Yeah. One other thing I wanted to mention as a highlight for me, because I always enjoy watching Liverpool at the end of the night, not only doing their stuff, but I'm always impressed through the years at all the people that they've backed up, you know, whether it's Ronnie Spector or Billy Preston or Doris Troy or whoever, Peter and Gordon, Billy J. Um, they perform now and then. And when they started to play now and then, the opening notes, the audience just went, oh. You know, so, and they, they did it just letter perfect. It was, mm -hmm. And one of the other tribute bands did now and then and did it so well. I was happy to see that song being, you know, acknowledged there. So, uh, yeah. Thanks. I actually found that, and this is the case every year, you have these great plans of hooking up with people. In fact, all the, throughout the course of the year, you know, sending messages back and forth. Well, we have to have a drink. We have to sit down and talk at the fest. And you think that'll be a piece of cake because I'm going to be there for three days, two and a half days, three days. And there, most of my plans never, I never happened. Right. Uh, I never saw Mark Rivera. Oh yeah. I had sent Mark Rivera a note saying we got to have, you know, got to get a couple of minutes to hang out together. I never saw him on Saturday. He was only there one day. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Hurtnick and I now are going on three years of trying to get a little time at the hotel bar and it didn't happen this year. Um, and that's a regret that, that that's when that meant that's when you realize uh, how fast it goes. And but um, kudos, 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 kudos to Mark Lapidos uh, for keeping the fest going now 50 years, starting it in 74. And uh, I know there were some logistical issues leading into the fest they had to deal with uh, and during the fest. Uh, but, you know, I think the, it was a smashing success. And again, looking forward to 2025. There you go. So, th there's another thing. I was really afraid, considering this was such a big anniversary, that there wouldn't be enough room for all the people. You could get around very easily, you know. Um, I think it was very spacious, you know, for the it worked for the out. I mean, the ballroom itself was small, but there was a large hallway right next to it. Mm. So people were in the hallway and it, it worked out fine in that regard. And there was a catwalk up above where the authors were and people hung out up there and had a good view. So I think they, you know, everybody who was there made do with it. I mean, if we had had another 5,000 people, it would have been a mess. Yeah. But it did accommodate the crowd perfectly. And and I agree with Darren about the hanging out with people thing. I was going to, uh, you know, I wanted to drop off a copy of the Please Please Me book to Mark Rivera because he has a great fan recollection in it. And, you know, Mark was like, yeah, I'll just get it at the fest from you. And, of course, that never happened. Yeah. And I didn't even make it. That, how many? I didn't even make it to the bar this time. <laughs> it's even like you and me, Bruce. I get a few words in. And that's about it. Yeah. <laughs> we do more talking here than we do at the fest. So, um, oh, one other thing I really loved when Lawrence Juber was on stage with Steve Holly and everybody else with Liverpool, and they did a tribute to Denny Lane, which was really nice. Mm. And Lawrence, in fact, sang no words. And I, I'm telling you, his his singing has gotten better and better. I never, I wasn't used to him singing. He started doing that at the fest a few years ago, and now his vocals are really very strong. Um, did Mullet Kintyre as well, so uh, I was very impressed with what the whole band did for Denny Lane on Sunday morning. Um, I think they were uh, broadcasting to one of the Breakfast with the Beatles shows, probably Dash, Dash Show. Uh, and they did a uh, rockestra theme. Ah, nice. Hear that live very often. Yeah. Well, they did that Saturday night when I saw them. Oh, did they? Yeah. Sometimes oh. you hear it twice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Paul Muldoon, a poet who, over the past several years, has had the good fortune to record hours of conversations with one of the world's greatest songwriters, Sir Paul McCartney reflecting on everything from the Beatles to Wings. The result is our new podcast, 
McCartney, A Life in Lyrics. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. All right, so let's get to our main topic this time, which is the Beatles' 60th anniversary of their arrival in America. And let's just start by asking Bruce, Al, and Alan, when was the first time that you remember hearing anything about the Beatles? And when was the first time you heard a song by them? And I'm I'm figuring for each of the three of you, it's I want to hold your hand, but I could be wrong. So let's start with Bruce. For me, it was hearing I want to hold your hand on the Newman School Bus Radio right after we got back from Christmas break. Uh -huh. And I just remember there was something different about the song. And I really liked it from the very get go. It had that, you know, good hooks and everything, as they say. And then the announcer said, and this is by a British group, the Beatles. And I thought, OK. And I had a radio in my bedroom. And I remember that week, you know, not only hearing it on the school bus, but also hearing it at nighttime on the radio or in the morning, even later on. And then all of a sudden I began hearing like, you know, another song by the Beatles. She loves you. And I thought, well, that's really weird. Why are they putting out another single so soon? And then all of a sudden, please, please me. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. This group's putting out three singles. Nothing added up at the time, of course. I learned later about they had come out and bombed initially, much, much later. But I just remember that. And, of course, um, my mom remembers whenever we had a carpool going and I Want to Hold Your Hand would come in on the radio, we all instantly would sing that song. Unlike, you know, that didn't happen before. And, you know, I was, what, eight years old at the time. And, of course, you know, that was my first introduction to the Beatles was instantly loving I Want to Hold Your Hand, which segues perfectly into Al Sussman, who can tell us what he first thought of I Want to Hold Your Hand. Al? But actually, before you do mm -hmm. that... Oh, you got to hear Al. <laughs> no, I, no, 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 I ask because some fans may not be aware of the fact that I Want to Hold Your Hand actually came out December 26th of 1963 mm -hmm. a lot of people might think oh everything happened in january so you heard i want to hold your hand that last week of december no i i, I didn't hear it until january in new orleans mm -hmm. oh, i mean yeah. i can i can give you the full history of why it came out early and all that other stuff but your initial question was you know for the three of us when did we first hear it we'll mm -hmm. get back to the history later but that's why it segues into al because al had Let's just say a different experience than I did with I Want to Hold Your Hand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Al? Uh, actually, I think I've told this story here before, but uh, it was uh, Tuesday night, January 7th. Uh, I was listening to WABC in New York, and uh, to Scott Muni, who was who at that time was doing the, uh, the nighttime primetime uh, show, which was in those days the nighttime primetime show show was the the showcase one for a, a top 40 station and uh, uh it was tuesday night which was new survey night on wabc and um and so i'm i'm ostensibly doing my uh eighth grade homework and uh following along and um i'm going it's going through the the top seven and uh everything seems to be pretty much the same and I'm thinking, what could be the uh, the number one song? Well, Scott plays the number one song, and it was the first time that I'd ever that ever heard a number one song that I had never heard before. <laughs> and it was "I Want to Hold Your Hand," and my reaction was quite different from Bruce's, and probably different from Alan's, and um, it was negative, and uh, it was just. I th it was just so new and so different from anything that was, you know, on the radio dial at that point. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, I just reacted negatively. It sounded like something from another planet. <clears throat> and then, and then the next day at school, the uh, the girls are going crazy over this group that probably a week earlier they hadn't heard of. Mm. And uh, and then that's I think later on that week, uh, Dan Ingram on WABC began playing the three Beatles records, all three 
songs, I'm going to hold your hand, she loves you, and please please me at 5 o'clock every afternoon, and which, which is something that they had never done. You know, generally they would play a song, a couple of commercials, play another song, a couple of commercials. They played all three songs consecutively and did it every afternoon. And and I'm building up this wall of resistance. <laughs> and it was actually the um, uh, the second Ed Sullivan show to to tie it up in a short way. Uh, it was the second Sullivan show that actually finally. Uh, made me a fan. Let me jump in. I have a question for you, Al. Sure. Do you remember that countdown on January 7th? What number? What was it? Seven? They did a top seven? Because seven yeah. to seven, yeah. Do you right. remember what numbers two to seven were? Do you have that written down anywhere? Or Actually, you can look it up very easily. Um, um, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a website called the New York Radio Message yes. Board. And uh, part of that uh, site is a WABC, actually WABC and WMCA. They, they have separate sections for both of those two stations. And part of their, those little mini sites uh, are all of the, the WABC surveys. And so if you look up the one for January 7th, You'll see that um, um, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of because Louis Louis by the Kingsmen was on that uh, on that survey. Uh, there I've said it again by Bobby Vinton. Uh, I think. Bob, I'm sorry, mermaids maybe was that around that? No, no, I said no that that has gone off. Um, uh, you don't own me by Leslie Gore. Yeah. Uh, Surfing bird by the Trash Men. Did you hear me say no. Bobby's Girl? Uh, no, no. Bobby's Girl was from 62, fall 62. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I'm was looking, I'm trying to find while well, we're talking. So, anyway. Hmm. Okay. So, but I think that you had said to me previously in another interview that you thought the Beatles were kind of all hype. At that, at that time. Well, not so much that, not that they were all hype, but that there just seemed to be it, you know, because of the fact that basically a week, a week before, you know, at New Year's Day, what I've always mentioned is that New Year's Day of 1964, virtually, you know, I would say the vast majority of Americans had never heard of the Beatles. Right. And 40 nights later, 73 million people tuned in to see them on the Ed Sullivan show. Right. Um, so, I mean, there was, there was a certain amount of hype, obviously um, uh, Bruce in uh, the Beatles are coming uh, illustrated uh, capitals promotion campaign. And there, you know, there was a fair amount of hype, but, uh, but actually it was kind of like, you know, the sort of the grassroots reaction to their, to their music by you know the kids um you know really kind of short-circuited capitals uh promotional uh efforts but um i you know it's it's probably it's i'm sure it's just me because uh i've always kind of been that way where something that's very new or very different i always kind of like eh, i don't know yeah. you know that's, I found that's the list. aha you did I found the list. Number seven was Popsicles and Icicles by the oh, Mermaids. So was oh, right. so it I was right. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. That was down two from number five a week ago. <laughs> right. Uh, at number six was Since I Fell for You by Lenny Welsh. Right. Got to be honest with you, I don't know either artist. Oh, come on. Yeah, you'd know the Mermaids. Uh, maybe Lenny Welsh, not the Mermaids. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, Popsicles and Icicles was written by David Gates. Yes. Right. Wow. It made him a lot of bread. Yeah. Then, <laughs> <laughs> At number five is the singing nun and mm -hmm. going, which That's is a favorite of Alan Alan Cozen. That was down from number two last week. Right. Uh, number four was Bobby Rydell and Forget Him, which um, we all did. 
<laughs> just going to say something like that. Uh, and at number three, holding steady from last week. There, I've said it again, Bobby Vinton. And number two, uh, down from number one, down to number two. Do the math, and it dropped one position. And that was <laughs> Louie Louie from the Kingsmen. And then up from number 35, the week earlier, I want to hold your hand from the Beatles. So that was, uh, that was your top seven. Uh, on WABC, the All-American Survey for the week of January 7th, 1964. Oh. And that, that was the thing about it was, when we get more into the history of it, how quick it happened in New York. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the nation followed pretty damn quick as well. But I'm, I'm anxious to hear Alan, since Alan wrote an entire book on I Want to Hold Your Hand, yeah. of his reaction. I'm always like amazed. Like Alan say, one I'm day, did, I just wonder, did Alan, when he first heard the song, say, this song is great, one day I'm going to write a book on it? Definitely didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, you know, I can't say when I first heard of the Beatles, but I know that word of the Beatles was like floating around before I ever heard I Want to Hold Your Hand. Um, first time I, wanna heard, I, I heard I Want to Hold Your Hand, which was the first Beatles track I ever heard, uh, was at the end of December. Uh, it was during Christmas vacation, and I had gone to Sears with my father. And they were playing, you know, the radio in Sears. Um, and I Want to Hold Your Hand came on. And I thought, oh, okay, so that's who these guys are, you know. And I was curious about it, having heard, you know, over the previous week or two so much about the Beatles. Uh, um, was probably a little suspicious um, for two reasons. First of all, I was at that point principally into classical music. Mm -hmm. um, and second, this is probably something that we don't really say today now that we're all adults and, and the world has changed so much. But when you're nine, as I was, stuff that girls liked was automatically not stuff that you liked. And the people who were the most enthusiastic about the Beatles in my school and just around were girls. So, you know, we didn't really know quite what to make of it. And like, you know, what would happen if this is really good stuff? Or, or are we going to be able to like this too, you know? Um, and, and it was. It was really good stuff, you know? I mean, I remember just standing there in Sears listening to this song and thinking, okay, you know, that's that's got a lot of interesting stuff going on in it. Like to hear that again sometime soon. Um, and, you know, sometime soon it, it, it became all that you heard, you know, plus she loves you. And, uh, you know, and then they were on Sullivan. By then everybody was going to be tuned into Sullivan. There was no question about that. You sort of had to. Um, and... They just looked cool. They acted cool. They moved cool. And uh, it just, you know, it, it, it kind of instantly won you over. Um, not quite sure it instantly won my parents over. <laughs> um, there was, you know, what, <laughs> what were considered outrageously long hair. Um, you know that they 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 couldn't quite deal with that, but um, the funny thing is, excuse me, it's that cold I mentioned. <laughs> the funny thing is, you know, if you look at, at what they played on Sullivan, they had calculated, you know, what all kinds of people would like. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, singing till there was you. Um, was definitely not for me and my friends. I think it was more for the parents. Um, but not just that, you know, because my mother pretty instantly became a fan of All My Lovin'. I mean, she didn't realize she instantly became a fan of it because six months later, when I was sitting there with a, you know, a, a, a music book playing some of their stuff, and I played All My Love, and she said, oh, really? That's by the Beatles? That's really good, you know? Um, so, you know, she 
I, I don't know what, what her first impression of it, hearing it on, on Sullivan was, but, you know, it's a great song and it's the first thing they did. And, uh, you know, it had to have broken some ice with a lot of people who might have been resistant. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, and then after that, school just became a Beatles wonderland. You know? <laughs> um, Bruce can tell me because my mind has compressed it all, but... How soon after that did the gum cards start coming out? They, they were pretty quick, and I mean, mm. the merchandising hit pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, the other thing, what, what you were saying, was was a great point about the brilliance of the programming that the Beatles did for that first Sullivan show. They, they you know they come on and they do all my loving, which anyone can enjoy. Then for the mums and dads and grandparents, they do till there was you from the Music Man, the musical, and then. To make sure their core audience doesn't turn the channel and watch Disney, uh, you know, to see the competition, they knock out "She Loves You," you know, and remind you, oh yeah, that's what the big beat's about. And the brilliance of it, not only on the Beatles, but on the part of CBS, where they have this handheld camera showing the audience reactions, mm -hmm. and that really hadn't been done before. And you've got the audience reactions. And then, you know, Red's followed by an Anison headache commercial, which is perfect. The parents must have been, where's my Anison? <laughs> you know? And then they come back on the show and they knock out their new single. And during I Want to Hold Your Hand, the camera work is brilliant. Yes. And, you know, and I remember when they do that shot going in on Ringo, it's from a crane shot coming down. And you, when they get there, Ringo's drumming sounds louder. Well, the reason was there was a microphone yeah. under that camera. And I saw that in pictures when I did the book, The Beatles Are Coming. So that's why the drumming gets louder. But it's perfect because the camera gets closer to Ringo. The drumming's loud. I mean, I wouldn't change a frame of I Want to Hold Your Hand. And they do. I saw her standing there. And then afterwards, Sullivan wisely programs, you know, this, uh, you know, acrobatic act of five phase mm. to let people kind of calm down. And then he tells everyone, drive home safely. I mean, it, it just was such an exciting night. Yeah, it was fun. The, um, we didn't talk about the Beatles Symposium at Monmouth University. But at that, we actually did watch the show again. And, you know, it's just great watching that show again. You know, you have to watch the entire show to put it in proper context. But the Beatles performance was just brilliant. It was also a master stroke that they did I Want to Hold Your Hand last. They made everybody wait for that song, which was the number one song in the country. Mm -hmm. so there was this tremendous buildup for that. But do you remember how soon was it that you heard that they were going to be on the Ed Sullivan Show? Was there was it constantly drilled in into your heads on the radio or something from, say, the beginning of January on? Or, or when exactly? About, or about the middle of uh, the about the middle of January at least uh, in New York. Yeah, and the thing about it, too, was that Sullivan began promoting the show right after Cronkite broadcast that story on the 10th. And do you, do you want me to do the Reader's Digest history of how we got there at this time, Ken? Or? Sure, why not? Okay, sure. so when I was doing my book, The Beatles, uh, Please Please Me to Whiff the Beatles, uh, I missed a domino when I had done The Beatles Are Coming. And the first thing that has to happen in the United States, well, first of all, you have to have a group that puts out a couple of great songs like Please Please Me and She Loves You that flops. And why that's important is, you know, they're going to come back later. Mm. But the first real domino is that Walter Cronkite and CBS in late August make the decision that effective September 1, the evening news is going to expand from 15 minutes to 30 minutes. And you might go, well, what's that have to do with anything? When you had a 15-minute news broadcast, you basically broadcast news. When it expanded to 30, that meant they had time for feature stories. And they also were launching the CBS Morning News with Mike Wallace, which did not have that big a budget. But because of the bigger budget of the evening news, they could run a feature story in the morning and in the evening, and they could spend a little bit more money on it. So that's the first kind of domino that falls into place for the Beatles. And so the London bureaus of the three networks, you know, CBS, NBC, and ABC, sent film crews to see the Beatles in Bournemouth, England on the 15th of November. 
And the Huntley Brinkley report, which his ratings were not as high as CBS, ran their story first. And the CBS story ran that Friday morning. And that Friday morning uh, with Mike Wallace, and nobody remembers broadcasting. It's certainly Mike Wallace didn't when I interviewed him, because a few hours later, President Kennedy is assassinated. Mm. So obviously, the story doesn't run that evening. So a few weeks later, on December 10, Walter Cronkite, who not only was the anchor man, he also was news director. He thought, well, you know, the past few weeks have been a bummer. You know, the president's dead. We have civil rights unrest. There's this Cold War with Russia. Why don't I dust off that little story on the Beatles that we were going to run a few weeks ago? And they run it that night. And the significance of it is, in addition to the normal people watching it, two very spe special people see it. One was Ed Sullivan. And Sullivan had taken a chance a month earlier by booking this group, the Beatles, for three shows that are virtually unknown in America. And when I interviewed Cronkite, he said as soon as he gets off the set, the phone rings and he gets this call from Ed and he says, Walter, what can you tell me about those bugs or whatever they call themselves? <laughs> and Sullivan is all excited. And so um, Cronkite refers them to you know someone else. And uh, the next day, CBS issues a press release. We're going to have the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. And this is unprecedented for that far in advance to be announcing who you're going to have on the show. The other famous person is Marsha Albert. She's a 15-year-old girl in Silver Spring, Maryland, and she watches the story with her parents. And at the end of the show, they have the Beatles doing She Loves You. And she immediately sends an email. No, no, they didn't have email back then. As Chuck Berry would say, she wrote a little letter to her local DJ. And that was WWDC, Carol James. And she wanted to know why we can't have music like this group, the Beatles, who were on the CBS Evening News. Well, fortunately, Carol James had seen the broadcast as well. And as fate would have it, he had a friend who was a stewardess, as they were called in those days, with British Overseas Airways Corporation, or BOAC. And so he asked her to bring the Beatles' latest record, which was not She Loves You, which was a story featured on Cronkite, but was I Want to Hold Your Hand. And so on the 17th of December, he has... Marsha Albert introduced it on the air, and then and it was taped for posterity. And uh, I, I can't really duplicate her voice, but it cracks at the beginning. And very mm -hmm. cutely, she says, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time in America, here are the Beatles with I Want to Hold Your Hand. And when it's over, uh, Carol James says, well, write us and let you know what you think. Well, the kids weren't waiting. They called up the station immediately, and they wanted to hear it again. And so it becomes in heavy rotation in WWDC. And, of course, Capitol has their lawyer, Walter Hofer, call them up and say, quit playing the record. It's not coming out till mid-January. And Carol James says, are you nuts? It's a hit. And so they get the record uh, back on the air. Capitol says, oh, yeah, OK. And Capitol makes the decision, and it's a key decision. Rather than the record coming out in mid-January, it comes out the day after Christmas. Why is that significant? Kids are out of school the day after Christmas. And what are they doing? They're playing video games, right? Wrong. They didn't have video games. They weren't on the computer. They were listening to the radio. And WMCA plays at first. And then WABC and WINS follow. And all of a sudden, the three stations in New York are playing it. Kids are out of school. They have Christmas and Hanukkah money. Mommy and Daddy can take them to the record store. And as Al told us, in about a week or so's time, it's number one in New York in like two weeks' time. And the rest of the nation quickly follows suit. Now, remember earlier I talked about those other songs. Well, because Please Please Me and She Loves You flop, their labels that they were on, Swan and VJ, re-release them. And this time, they don't flop. And so all of a sudden, you've got three great songs getting saturation airplay. So when Sullivan has the Beatles on his show, think about if I Want to Hold Your Hand comes out mid-January. Maybe he gets the usual 20 to 30, maybe a few more, maybe 40 million. But because of all the saturation, airplay, and buildup, 73 million people tune in. That would not have happened. But for CBS expanding the evening news, Cronkite running the feature, Marsha Albert calling in, Carol James playing it. 
all these things make it explode. And because of what I call the time compression factor, a lot of people go, well, I didn't really hear about the Beatles to the Sullivan show. Wrong. Mm -hmm. 73 million people wouldn't have tuned in if they were unknown. The reason exactly. so many people tuned in was you had saturation radio airplay. You had articles at Life magazine and other things. So people knew about this well in advance of Sullivan, a good couple of weeks. And what I tell people is that the significance of the Sullivan show was to put the explanation point on Beatlemania. Mm. Uh, could you explain a, a little bit about why Sullivan subsequently created this myth of having seen the Beatles come back from Sweden when he was in London and, and that's why he signed them. I mean, yeah, that's, why that's, did he bother doing that? Um, I think sometimes the truth is not as good. And I don't think Sullivan invented it. I think someone in his PR department came up with that little story. But as and what Alan is mentioning is every book, including I'm embarrassed to say, Meet the Beatle, uh, introducing the Beatles. Um, you know, the Beatles are coming. Um, I can't even remember the name of my own book. That's a senior moment. The Beatles uh -huh. are coming. I and mentioned it also there the how because, I it changed everything. You know, you know, because it's in every single thing and it's it's there and all. But the point was this when I did a little bit of digging after that book came out, I realized no, no, no. The key connection was very boring. What if it had been Sullivan's story was well, I got a phone call from Peter Prichard, and Peter Prichard said there's this group, the Beatles, who are doing well in England. And Peter Prichard's my talent scout. He works for Lou Grade. And uh, basically, on Peter's recommendation, I agreed that I would have a meeting with Brian Epstein. I wasn't sure why, but Peter said, oh, they played for British royalty. And I said, OK, I'll talk to Brian. Not a great story. Mm -hmm. But that, but Peter Prichard was the uh, person behind it when he knew Brian was going to the States. Peter called up Brian and said, listen, uh, you need to get on the Sullivan show and I can make that happen. And let me call Ed and work something out for you. And Brian said, oh, no, 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 no. I like to do my own deals. And Peter said, fine, I'll make the connection for you. So Peter Prichard is the key thing back there. And Sullivan meets with Brian and he's absolutely blown away with the enthusiasm that Brian has. Grant, you know, Sullivan hadn't heard a note of Beatles music. And, you know, and he's meeting with Brian. Brian didn't bring him records to play. He's basically booking the Beatles on Peter Prichard's recommendation and Brian's enthusiasm. And as they're meeting at the uh, Delmonica Hotel, toward the end of their first meeting, uh, Brian says to the effect, well, of course, my boys will be the headliners. And Sullivan says, oh, no, 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 no. You know, it's the Ed Sullivan show. I make those decisions. And, you know, and Brian's a little bit upset about it. Uh, but the next day they work it out, you know, particularly Bob Preck, the you know producer of the show, shows up for that meeting as well. And Preck gets the idea, if, you know, if we're going to be paying money to have him over here, let's tape a third show. But what Sullivan had worked out on his own was really quite brilliant because Brian had told him we have this open time before we need to record some music and start filming this film. And so it works out. He says, well, look, we'll have you in New York on February 9. And then a week later, we can have you in Miami Beach. We're doing this live show from the Deauville Hotel. And Mitzi Gaynor is the headliner on that show. And there's no way Sullivan's changing that. And he never did. Mitzi Gaynor was the headliner, but the Beatles opened and closed the show. But if you ask Mitzi Gaynor, who headlined the show, she will tell you she was a headliner. And she's correct. She was. She was too darn hot not to be the headliner. Uh -huh. So anyway, uh, that's kind of Sullivan makes this gamble. And he says, well, look, you know, we'll pay you per show $3,500, which is pretty much what Sullivan was paying acts at that time. Bigger name acts were getting anywhere from five to 8,000. Mitzi Gaynor and her production company got $20,000 for the show and you know, Miami Beach. And then for the tape show, they only got 3000 So you're saying, wait a minute, Bruce. Three shows, $10,000, half of what Mitzi Gaynor got, Brian got screwed. Wrong. It was a great deal for Brian because 73 million people saw the Beatles. And it was a great deal mm -hmm. for Sullivan, obviously, because 73 million people tuned into his show. 
it was win, win, win for everyone. But to put things in proper perspective, I was able to get the Sullivan budgets for the first quarter of 64 and also getting $3,500 on the Ed Sullivan show about a month or so later was Topo Gigio, the Italian mouse. <laughs> <laughs> so. Now, that's, that's <laughs> it. You know, even Ringo, I've seen him on late night television uh, repeating the story of Ed Sullivan seeing the Beatles and coming from Sweden. So even he's believing the story. Well, here's the point, though. Ringo mm -hmm. obviously didn't see Ed Sullivan at the airport. Ringo's mm -hmm. merely telling a story that's been told time and time and time and time again right. to the point of where it becomes the truth. Mm -hmm. And it did become the truth for many years. When I started, I, I doubted it when I talked to Peter Presharp when I interviewed him for The Beatles Are Coming. And I asked Peter point blank, I'm beginning to think Sullivan wasn't there. Was Sullivan there? And Peter said, well, you know, Bruce, that's been the story for all these years. And, and, and I should have interpreted that to be, Bruce, he wasn't there. Well, shortly after the uh, book came out, I was at Beatles, I was at, you know, for the, for the, it was in the 40th anniversary. And I talked to Vince Calandra, who was a staff member of the Sullivan Show. And he said, Bruce, you know, I did want to talk to you about that because this thing about Peter Prechard makes a lot of sense. And he said, you know, when we were filming the show or doing the show, you know, regular, it was a live show, Sullivan didn't go out of town during that time. And so that made a light go off, you know, maybe. And then after that, the next thing was there was a guy doing a show, a book, I mean, on Ed Sullivan. And he said, Bruce, I've read all the talk of the town columns. And usually Ed would talk about my wife and I just got back from so-and-so. But there's nothing in November about he and his wife getting back from London. And he clearly would have said, I just got back from London. Uh, I saw the Beatles. There's none of that. And to me, that pretty much nailed it. And then the final nail in the coffin uh, of that story was um, Bob Preck had said he wasn't doing any more interviews. So I didn't get to interview him for the 40th anniversary. But I met his daughter a few years later at, when I did a book fair in Maryland. And she sent a copy of The Beatles Are Coming to him. And about a year later, I get a call at my office, you know, uh, Bruce Spizer, this is Bob Preck. Do you know who I am? I said, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> and he said, I'm really sorry for not getting back to you sooner. But I read the book. And he said, you know, you nailed it. You got everything right, except, and I said, uh-huh. He said, yep, as you, I'm sure, suspected, Sullivan, as far as I know, was not in London at that time and certainly would not have been. So, but it was great getting the call from Bob Precht and realizing that, you know, the book was accurate in describing the meetings that did take place. Um, so, you know, but I'm glad you raised that point, Alan. It was you know, something that everybody believes, and it sounds good the first time, and it just stuck. But nope, wasn't there. Also, Sullivan did the show live every week, and in you know at the end of October, he it still would have been you know right in the heart of the. Uh, of the I mean, that's of the what Vince Calandra said. There's no way he would have left during that time frame. Exactly. Yeah. You know that he would leave during the summer when they ran tape shows and they didn't really run that many reruns what they would do a lot of times was some weeks they would do two shows and one would be you know live and the other one would be in the middle of the week with a live audience that they would tape for summer broadcast mm -hmm. and they took one of those shows for summer broadcast and made that the third Beatles show but they put clips of the Beatles in Sullivan knew they were doing that so that's why on the after the dress rehearsal on the knife, which Leslie Healy, who was Beetle Tripper, who was on one of the panels we were with, right. talked about how lucky she was because she was there for the live, I mean, you know, the live dress rehearsal. So she sees the Beatles on a dress rehearsal. Then they get to see the Beatles do the three songs that they're going to do for the third show. And then she goes home and gets to watch the show. How cool was that? So I think she was actually luckier than the girls that were in the audience, mm -hmm. you know, to see that because she saw the Beatles first and got that extra bit. 
So, you know, just in, incredible stuff uh, that you, uh, you know, you learn when you research it. And even 60 years on, you know, you, more things ring in your head, like the CBS News expanding by 15 minutes. Yeah. I don't know how I missed that 40 years ago, mm. but uh, it's fascinating stuff. I have a question for Al. Uh, Al, you were had you said you you did not get bit by the Beatles bug when you first what? heard "I Want right. to Hold Your Hand," and you said it w a, 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 it wasn't until what, was it the second or third appearance? The, the second, the second was the the, the, uh, the first show didn't do it for me. But the, and you were watching though. You were watching though. Right? Oh, absolutely. Saw, and still, when it was over. And I went in very much with a okay, Beatles, show me what uh, what you're what you've got, and it just it didn't it didn't do it for me. The second show, that was the one that did it, um, and it wasn't until years later that I realized why um, that show was being was done instead of in the the you know the sterile confines of the CBS uh, TV studios. It was done in a hotel ballroom at the uh, the Deauville Hotel, Miami Beach. And it's on a they were on a small stage. And they were they actually were only a few months removed from playing ballrooms in England. So they were really in their element. And they're very close to each other. Uh, also the sound mix, as it were, um, accentuated Paul's bass and Ringo's drums, which, as we know, were the, you know, the best rhythm section in all of rock and roll. And that got to me. And uh, and the I guess the moment that really did it for me was when the three of them gathered around the, the microphone around around John's mic and uh, and did this boy. Uh, I, I guess probably because I had listened to a lot of group harmony music in the last you know four or five years before that and it just and to see them gathered around the same microphone and all uh it just to a 14 year old uh i just thought it was very cool so I'm you Al, uh, actually cut your teeth as a young boy listening to doo-wop and 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 uh and uh, group harmony stuff exactly. in new york city Exactly. My brother used to uh, sneak a radio into the bedroom to listen to Alan Freed mm. in the late 50s and to Jocko's Rocket Ship show out of Philadelphia. And then when I started listening to rock and roll seriously about 1961, there was a lot of doo-wop, group right. harmony, whatever you want to call it, uh, on the radio at that time. Mm. Uh, Bruce... Fantastic. Yeah, you know, I was going to say, Al, that when you point that out, to me, that's one of the most intimate moments of the Washington Coliseum show. Yes. Which is utter chaos. Yet the three of them at that single microphone, and I've never seen a Beatles tribute band do that with one microphone. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have, but I've never seen it. And to me, that was just such a stirring moment, not only on Sullivan, but Washington Coliseum. And when I hear this boy that image of them at the microphone is burned into my mind because we didn't have videos in those days Me like too. MTV. Yeah. But yeah. those two, you know, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Al. Great mm -hmm. moment. Absolutely. Magical moment for sure. See what we missed, Ken, by being so young. <laughs> I wanted to clear up one thing. Bruce, Al, you probably know this, but um, – who was really the first DJ in America to play a Beatles record? Now, I believe, I could be wrong, that it's Dick Biondi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, WLS. Dick oh, Biondi. Exactly. Uh, you know, I, I remember um, kind of putting it all together and working backwards because there are certain people that are given credit. But Dick Biondi, we know, played it in February of 1963. And there's an air check of him playing it in toward the latter part of February, around the 21st or something. But he probably played it, uh, you know, if not on February 7th, I think maybe definitely February 14th would be maybe the first time. And the thing about Biondi is even like, you know, a few weeks later, he's playing, you know, like, a, um, you know, a Steve Lawrence song, and then he's playing Mr. Bassman and a few other things. And then he gets a 
you know, the Beatles, and he's like, the Beatles will please, please me. Mm -hmm. You can tell he genuinely likes the song, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I had asked mm -hmm. him about that, and he said, well, Ewart Abner, who was president of VJ, and he said that Ewart, you know, just he, all he remembers, Ewart said, you know, this is a new one we're putting out. You know, it's going to be really big. You should play it. And he said, well, Ewart said that about everything, but, you know, he did give it a spin. And uh, the other great line that Dick Biondi, who died a few years back, gave me was he said, Ewart Abner had the best booze and the best girls. And <laughs> he just left it at that. <laughs> so it wasn't payola. It was booze ola and girl ola, I guess. <laughs> it also helped that VJ Records was in Chicago. Yes, that was a key component. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing about that was it wasn't just Chicago. Although it was not a big hit anywhere, it made top 60 or 40 in markets like, you know, Houston, Miami, in California, mm. uh, Seattle. It got airplay in Hawaii. So, you know, it did get airplay, but Americans didn't jump on it for whatever reason. So, you know, it wasn't like, gee, the, you know, the record was never played anywhere except Chicago. That's not true. And uh, from me to you, got off to a shaky start because of the Del Shannon competing version of From Me to You. You know, imagine you're a disc jockey and you get a record in and it's, you know, um, by this group called The Beatles and then the same song by Del Shannon. Mm. Well, Del Shannon had had a runaway hit a few years earlier called Runaway. So you're going to play Del Shannon mm. over The Beatles. And that pretty much happened. In, it happened in Chicago. Why? Why didn't Dick Biondi play it? Dick Biondi got fired by WLS right around the time the record came out. So Biondi couldn't play it. He, lo he relocates out to California, and he's working at KRLA, and KRLA picks it up, and as does a station in San Bernardino, and it almost becomes a big hit in L.A. Ironically, it gets up to, I think, about 32 on KRLA's chart, and mm. at that time, Dave Dexter of Capital is in the Capitol Tower listening to She Loves You and I'm Confessing by Frank Ifield, and he decides I'm Confessing is going to be a hit and She Loves You is not suitable for the American market. The guy was so out of touch, he didn't know the Beatles had a top 40 hit in his own freaking backyard. <laughs> I'm Bruce no, I can't make that stuff up. Uh, one Ow. other aspect that, that, that gets mentioned an awful lot and that I personally, for a lot of reasons, have never bought. I'm curious what Bruce and Al feel. Is this business of um, the Beatles became really big in America because we were also depressed after Kennedy was shot? I don't know. I don't buy no, it. Doesn't either. And, and thank you for bringing that up. I mean, Al and I'll both talk about it, but I will tell you first, um, I remember where I was, like everybody else, when President Kennedy Sure. was assassinated. I was in the third grade, it's a Friday afternoon, and the teacher got called out of the room, which was strange. And when the teacher walked out of the room, it was Friday and we were kids, and a lot of us, I don't know if you remember the big pens, we took out the ink cartridges and they yeah. became pea shooters and we started <laughs> shooting spitballs around the room. And the teacher walked back in, white as a ghost. She walked up to the blackboard, and I may lose it here because it just floods back in my mind, she wrote on the blackboard, the president is dead, class dismissed, and we all cried. And that was a big deal. But that was in November. Kids are resilient. Mm -hmm. By the time you get to December, we're not mourning over President Kennedy. Yes, it was tragic and sad, but we've kind of moved on. It's Christmas now. And, you know, the other thing is this. It wasn't cause and effect. I'd be lying if I said the Beatles didn't cheer me up. Of course they did. But it wasn't that. And, and look at this. The Beatles were big in England, Japan, and New Zealand, Australia, Germany, Denmark. Did their head of state get assassinated? No. It's clearly not cause and effect. It is overplayed. Alan, you are 100% right. But it did have one effect, though. And it was the same thing that happened in England. In England, you had some scandals. And all of a sudden, the Beatles were a kind of fun story for Fleet Street to run. And they ran with it. 
right around the time of the London Palladium show, the British equivalent of the Sullivan show. The same thing in the U.S. You know, it was a fun story to run in a really dark time. And if you love the Beatles, you ran the story. And if you hated the Beatles, you ran the story. And it was press for the Beatles either way. So the only effect that the Kennedy assassination had is it might have made the press more hungry for a fun story. But it certainly wasn't, oh, I'm depressed about President Kennedy. If only there were the Beatles to bring me out of this. Not cause and effect at all. Mm -hmm. Hal, I know you can and, elaborate. And it's, you know, not the nicest thing in the world to to mention, but the fact is that um, the assassination was not, um, well, Kennedy himself was not universally beloved in the country, especially in the South, where he was considered uh, to be an appeaser to the Soviet Union because of his uh, overtures toward better relations with uh, with the Soviet Union and also and uh, particularly in the area of, uh, of of civil rights where it was felt that he was uh, he was an interloper that he was uh, that he was trampling on states rights and um, you know certainly Bruce being from Louisiana you were probably privy to do at least some of that no I, I, I fortunately, didn't hear anybody tell me I'm glad that the guy's dead. And I know mm -hmm. there were people that were saying it, but I didn't hear that. I think some people thought, well, well Johnson's one of us. There's no way that he's going to push this civil rights foolishness. And, of course, Johnson did, uh, fortunately. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, when you t I talked to Mark Nabishak, who was in Dallas, and he said for him it was a really big deal. I mean, you know, because – it was in their city, and it and it devastated them. Even though sure. they had doubts about him, and I think his experience was different than mine, certainly because of being in Dallas. But I think the universal thing is, you know, that wasn't true. There also were theories that people had. Uh, Dr. Joyce Brothers, you know, the very famous pop psychologist, uh, so, you mm -hmm. know, she came up with all these theories about why the girls love the Beatles and the Peter Pan syndrome and all kind of other crazy stuff. And the funny thing about it was, for the 40th anniversary, I got to meet Dr. Brothers. She and I were on a panel at the Hard Rock Cafe in New York. And I showed her a copy of the book, and I had a two-page spread called Dr. Brothers, I presume, and it quoted from her articles. And she read it, and she was looking at me, and she says, did I really say that? And I said, uh-huh. And we had a good laugh over it. And uh, the weird thing about it was years later, I started getting emails from people saying, you know, Bruce, here's a link to an article you're in. And what it was was Dr. Brothers had died, and the last pictures taken of her were uh, being with me at this event. And so, uh, you know, I brought back a lot of memories of that. But she was a, she's a really cool lady. She, you know, she said, uh, you know, all that stuff she had written, you know, she, she knew it wasn't on target at all. But and mm -hmm. she loved the Beatles. She met with them and you know, that pictures of her with the Beatles and how much she enjoyed being with them. But I think a lot of this was people could not come up with a rational explanation of why people were so attracted to the Beatles. It can't be the music because it's horrendous is what they were thinking. So, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, President Kennedy, that makes sense. And right. I think that was part of it, too. Yeah. And the, uh, you know, the bottom line is that is that there were 11 weeks between November 22nd and when, when almost, almost exactly, almost to the minute uh, between November 22nd and when they landed in America on uh, February 7th. And 11 weeks to, you know, young people at that time, that's a, that's a good, good amount of time. You know? you know, I think I told you yeah. that there was a, a documentary. Actually, you were on... Um you were on, was the things we said today? I don't remember sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> okay. Um, with Michael Lynch, we were talking about the Dave Clark Five, and there was a documentary yes. that came out, and Tom Hanks was the host, and he came mm -hmm. out. America needed the Dave Clark Five because of what happened when we lost our president in November. So even with the Dave Clark Five, you have to attribute it to the right. president. It's like it's carried you know, even further. 
it's we not cause and effect. That's the bottom line. Exactly. But I'd be lying if I didn't say it cheered us. Of course, it cheered us up. It cheered up people all over the world. Mm -hmm. You know, right? We, we know that the <clears throat> audience for the first Ed Sullivan show was seventy-three million. Mm -hmm. What was the audience like for the second and third appearance? It dropped uh, off drastically the second week to seventy-two million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And by the third week, it had it had dropped back to more normal numbers. I think it was more than like forty some odd million, mm -hmm. uh, which still, you know, that was more than would normally tune into Sullivan. So, um, you know, that you know seventy three to seventy two. I mean, come on, man, that's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and it should be should be noted that Sullivan's Sullivan's show. Basically, it was the most popular of all the variety shows on TV at that time. And uh, it, it, it basically averaged about 35 million people for, you know, a, you know, pretty much 30 to 35 million people for just their regular run. And I can remember in the, I guess, what, in the uh, early, early 2000s and the producers of American Idol would be uh, trumpeting the fact that uh, that uh, you know 35 million people tuned in to their you know their lat their final show of a, of a season and it was uh, and you know you think Sullivan would get, would get that much every week and those two Beatles shows doubled his normal his normal rating his normal Small viewer population yes exactly because at that time there were uh the population of the country was 194 million people and a lot of a lot of those people still didn't have televisions either because they couldn't afford them or people like my my grandfather who wanted nothing to do with yeah. television <laughs> and those who did have it had only like three or four channels yes exactly i mean in new york was a we had you know seven channels yeah. you know that was a big deal yep. four was kind of uh for a lot of big cities in new orleans was kind of ahead of the curve on tv we had tv you know early in the 50s and the thing about new orleans was we had abc nbc cbs and we had public television mm -hmm. now a lot of cities you would have an affiliate that would be, you'd look at it and be ABC slash CBS, meaning they would pick program from the two networks because that town only had two stations. Mm. Uh, you know, so it wasn't like it was. And as Al said, you know, you have one TV in your house. If you had one at all, it was pretty common. And mm. so families would gather around the telly on a Sunday night. You know, a lot of families had the grandparents over for dinner on Sunday. So you had three generations, grandpa, your parents and yourself watching TV. Well, what could you all watch together? The Ed Sullivan Show. You weren't going to be watching Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea together. You know? <laughs> so that was a, a big thing. And that's why uh, it tuned in so many, uh, so many people. And, you know, you try to explain the concept of a variety show to someone today. And they just, yeah. they don't get it really like trying to explain top 40 radio to them. Yeah. You know, they're mm -hmm. just not going to get it. What do you mean Sinatra, the Beatles, Fats Domino all at the same time? You know, they don't get it. Yeah. Well, you, you did have Flipper. Yes. They, they could which get was, all which was the, yeah. so Flipper was nothing. Flipper to me was nothing but, I love Flipper, but uh -huh. it was Lassie as a Dolphin, to be honest. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for Alan. Since you wrote the book, Got That Something, how I want to hold your hand changed everything other than the fact that that was the song that broke the beatles in america how else did it change everything what else is there <laughs> that is a pretty significant thing I, I gotta say um you know at the time i wrote the book <clears throat> something that came up that with uh, that i hadn't expected when i started it which was a group called Moving Sidewalks <laughs> reissued <laughs> all of their old stuff. And Moving Sidewalks became ZZ Top. <laughs> and they had put out I Want to Hold Your Hand as a single in 1968. And so it was on the reissued album. And so while I was researching the book, I called Billy Gibbons <laughs> to talk about why on earth a blues band 
would record a song like I Want to Hold Your Hand in 1968. Because if you think about it, I mean, in 1968, the Beatles wouldn't even have been playing I Want to Hold Your Hand if they were still giving concerts. 1968 was a world away musically and in every other way. And yet here you have this group and the version they did was kind of a bluesy version with, you know, kind of a leer, which in a way, the title of my book, Got That Something, came from because the way they sing, you know, you got that something, totally different from the way the Beatles sang it. And suddenly the implications were completely clear, you know, <laughs> just like, you know, she was just 17 and you know what I mean, you know? That's wink, wink. Yeah, the Beatles, the mm -hmm. Beatles sang it, it all sounds so innocent. But moving sidewalks, I think, really got to the heart of it. Um, so, you know, it's not as if as if there wasn't sex in rock songs before the Beatles. But the Beatles came along and did it in a really stealthy way that really opened up the whole thing. So you hear I Want to Hold Your Hand, and it's bright and cheerful and major key and harmonies and clapping and and you know it just sounds like so innocent but when you start listening to what's going on which i guess i didn't really do until i heard moving, moving sidewalks version you begin to realize that this is really sort of a big trojan horse bringing the sexual so revolution into um popular culture in a big way and you know and and it's true you know as a nine-year-old kid i didn't really hear it and and i didn't hear it subsequently because i was still hearing i want to hold your hand as a nine-year-old kid for a long time apparently um but other people were getting it you know you read about um the beatles on tour and you you hear about john saying you know we were satiricon on tour um yeah it was it was all going on we didn't know it because we weren't privy to what was going on backstage at beatles shows but um but yeah and in, in mm -hmm. a way i to hold your hand change that too yeah the girls got it yeah i think they got it before we did <laughs> sure. Sure. Well, they got the whole Beatle thing before we did. Yes, exactly. I, I've always said that they did. It was the girl fans that did the heavy lifting. You know, yeah. they're the ones that went to the airports. They're the ones that uh, kept vigil in front of the hotels. Uh, they were the ones who uh, went to the concerts. Because, you know, if you look at film of Beatles concerts, there aren't a lot of males there. And right. I personally don't know of any personally I don't know any males who who went to to Beatles concerts. Yeah, it was right. you know in that school after the concert was on a Wednesday night, and the next day in mm -hmm. my class there were girls bragging about that they had been there and and how great it was and and all that other. But you, it, I don't know if maybe one or two guys in my class, if that, were there. I didn't get to go. I, it was a, a heartbreak story. My older sister. I have two older sisters, and one of them, it was her 16th birthday that night, and that isn't what she wanted to do for her birthday. And she was in a Barbara Streisand primarily, Peter, Paul, and Mary. My other sister, who was more hip and liked the Marvelettes and things like that, she didn't have say-so, and there was no way I was going to go on my own, and I couldn't desert my sister on her birthday. So, But I figured I'd see them the next year they came back. Of course, they never came back to New Orleans. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Oh, you never knew us then. They could have invited us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but this is another thing, um, you know, to get back to the very beginning of the show and Fest. This is another thing that's changed a lot, I think, over the years in Fest, because it, it used to be that <clears throat> there was like a women's panel and all the other panels mm -hmm. were guys. And now right. we're seeing panels that are mixed. But we're also seeing, you know, in a way, the women have kind of forced this by writing really interesting books about the Beatles. Yes, perspective. exactly. You know, um, there are quite quite a few and some new ones this year, like um, uh, Fashioning the Beatles, uh, Deirdre Kelly. Um, you know, Christine Barrett Feldman's book isn't new this year, but, you know, Women's History of the Beatles is... Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it kind of takes a look at a lot of the stuff that that we're we're just talking about now. Um, 
that you know kind of uh, kind of helps even this this story out a bit because you know like like I had said you know as a nine year old boy and you, you didn't want to like the stuff that the girls like but in a way once it was the Beatles you couldn't help it you had to admit that the girls were on to something here you know. Mm -hmm. You know, and we were, you know, down in our friend, my down in my friend's basement, you know, when they had Beatles wigs and brooms, <laughs> brooms standing in as guitars and, you know, playing the records and pretending to be the Beatles and the whole thing. And and then in school during the day, you know, once the Beatles cards started coming out and, um, you know, Beatles book covers and Beatles everything. I mean yeah, Beatles magazines. Yeah, Beatles nice. magazines. This is this is probably the first I think this is the first American Beatles uh Beatles fan magazine put out by uh ironically the <laughs> date book date book magazine, which of course had a uh quite a history of them later on. Yes. But I'm we sorry, could do a know, show on that sometime. You know Invite Al and I back for that one. Yeah, Alan, uh, you, you, your background was—you said it earlier on that you were a classical uh, fan growing up, and the Beatles were, I guess, the first pop pop group that you were kind of exposed to. Um, you know, I'd heard pop music on the radio. My parents listened to some. You tuned into Ed Sullivan. You saw other kind of pop music that they had. I was aware of it, but right. okay. it didn't particularly do anything for me, you know, until the Beatles. You know, do, do, it, it was just something special about it. I don't know. Do you remember then the door, who else came in the door for you? Other groups that appealed to you once you saw the Beatles and you maybe were paying closer attention? Well, you know, once once I started paying attention to the Beatles and then started listening to WABC and WMCA and all the places that you were likely to hear Beatles music, I sort of got, you know, drawn into the top 40 and, the you know, everything that was around at that time. And, you know, I still have a soft spot for a lot of that music. And it could be the Supremes and the temptations um but it could also be sam the sham and the pharaohs you know i mean there was there was a lot of stuff in those days that you know i wouldn't hold up as you know great music like i said sure. the beatles the zenith of western civ these things were not the zenith of western civ but they were fun and they were context you know you know you were hearing sam the sham and the pharaohs doing Wooly Bully and Little Red Riding Hood, and then the Beatles would come along with, you know, Paperback Writer and Rain, and yeah, clearly a cut above, but Sam the Sham was still fun. Right. Know? Well, it was like that. That was the, the great thing about Top 40 Radio, was, you know, you, you know, you just heard in, incredible music, because that was, it was good music. It wasn't, you know, genre-defining. I mean, could Motown have been as big without Top 40 music? You know, maybe not, because you know, I mean, in New Orleans, we had we did have two stations that primarily played black music, and they had the, the best call signs, WYLD for wild and WBOK because it'd be okay to listen to. <laughs> Great stations. Um, but, you know, the Beatles were, you know, on the two top 40 stations, of course, and there was a local musician, Deacon John, uh, who... who a black musician, um, a little bit older than me, and because um, I say that because he would play at our high school dances, and I was on a panel with him um, for an anniversary of the Beatles concert in New Orleans, and what he talked about, he said he went to the concert um, because he could tell as a musician, you know, when he was, uh, you know, in college, I guess in those days, that the chord structures and everything was so different than the other music of its day. It wasn't the standard one, four, five progression or the standard this progression or that progression. It was adventurous. And he enjoyed playing Beatles songs because, you know, it was a challenge to figure out what they're doing on guitar. And I think that a lot of people sometimes overlook the fact of how creative the music was. I mean, Alan certainly can talk about that because rock and roll pretty much they were 
two major progressions that almost every song was. And then, you know, you heard Please Mr. Postman, you heard Mashed Potatoes, exact same chord progressions and things like that. Chuck Berry, one, four, five progression and almost everything. But the Beatles, every single single was different. The mm -hmm. only thing they had to tie them together initially was harmonica. And they stopped that gimmick with She Loves You, although the B-side had harmonica. And after that, harmonica rarely appeared. But think of any other group. Motown would put out like, you know, three songs in a row by a group. And the, you know, and the by the time they got to the third rewrite of the first song, they'd move on to something else. Hmm. The Beatles never did that. You know, the Beatles were never said, go into the studio and do another Please Please Me or give us another I Want to Hold Your Hand. Whereas Holland Doja Holland at Motown, I'm sure Barry Gordy was telling him, you know, okay, look, dancing in the street was really good. Give me another one. So they come up with live wire, you know, and things like that. The Beatles never fell into that trap. Mm -hmm. Alan, uh, I'm, I'm curious with you, <clears throat> since even at the age you were at that point, at, at nine, you were somewhat steeped in classical music. Was it possibly the melodies of of those early Beatles songs that particularly got to you? Because I've always felt that that the the kind of the secret sauce of much of that early Beatles music was the uh was the melodies. Yeah, definitely the melodies, but also like Bruce says, the chord progressions were different mm -hmm. than everyone else's chord progressions. And you know, if you're if you're listening to music with a sense of harmony, um, which you would if you were listening to classical music as well. I mean, not that there aren't great melodies in classical music, but sure. a lot of what's going on is is harmonic invention. And a group like the Beatles comes along and their harmonies are different than all the other rock groups. It's, you know, that, that kind of catches you too. Also, you know, something about the energy, you know, if, apart from the purely mm -hmm. musical stuff, I mean, there was just something about the energy of what they were doing that – you know, grabs you as a nine-year-old in a way that, you know, maybe those Chopin etudes don't quite do. Yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I, it was something else I was going to say where I forgot, but um, I don't know, maybe it'll come to me later. Well, when you talk about the energy of it, and, you know, and that's, of course, a great point. I mean, the Beatles, look, there's nothing wrong with Please, Mr. Postman by the Marvelettes. It's great. I loved the single when it came out. Mm -hmm. But when I heard the Beatles do it, it had more energy. They mm -hmm. would push the beat a little bit on a lot of those songs, not on all, but on them. And um, for me, the greatest two rock and roll vocals of all time, and I'll say it and say it again, Twist and Shout by the Beatles with John Lennon's scorching vocal and mm -hmm. Long Tall Sally with Paul. Mm -hmm. And not only Paul's vocal... But listen to Ringo's drumming at the end of that song. He is all over the freaking drum kit. And Little Richard had a great drummer in the studio with him. But Ringo tears that song apart. Um, you know, and then you take a song like I'll Get You. The energy's there. And never mind the fact that John and Paul are singing different lyrics at one point. There was so much energy in that take that George Martin didn't even bother editing it. Fine, we'll put it out as is. And the other story I like to tell about those early songs is there was a disc jockey, Dick the Derby Smith, in Worcester, Massachusetts. And in December, this is pre I Want to Hold Your Hand and pre anything exploding, they had a station, WORC, and their survey was based on listener requests only. They had two surveys, one on listener requests only. And in mid December, number 10 on the charts was she loves you and you go wow that's really cool what was number one for those of you who don't already know the answer i'll get you by the beatles a beatles b-side was the number one song it had that energy or it had that something as uh, as alan cozen said exactly the, the other thing I, I guess I was thinking of in terms of the classical music and beatles things was and and where the energy really comes in is I mean this is a story I've told a number of times and it's in the it's it's in the intro of my um Tavern to the Roof talk book. Um I was taking piano lessons. My teacher my teacher's father was one of the last students of Franz Liszt. 
And so she had all kinds of, you know, Listiana all over her house. She had framed cigar butts. She had pictures of lists, <laughs> autographs, letters, you name it. Um, you know, and one day I was, um, I, I'd, I'd gone for my piano lesson and I was waiting for my father to pick me up outside her house. And I was, you know, so I'm nine years old. It's that spring um, <laughs> after Sullivan car comes along it's a convertible it's packed with high school students the top is down it's guys and it's girls and she loves you is blasting out of the radio and they're all singing and i think that moment was the end of latency for me because <laughs> I mean, i'm thinking wow convertible girls heels <laughs> This is <laughs> this is the whole world right here. Yeah, in car, you know. Uh, forget about listing his cigar butts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Davy Jones on the Sullivan Show, where he sees the reaction the girls are doing. Is you know, in the back of his mind, he's thinking, "Yeah, enough of these Broadway plays." You know, <laughs> this is this is what it, this is what it's all about. <laughs> yeah. Plus the the you know, the guys that were watching the show. Got the Tom Petty's and Billy Joel's and Bruce Springsteen's who were watching that first show and saw the the reaction of the girls and they're thinking, I want that. You know, not yeah. only the, not only the girls, but also the reaction that they were the the that the Beatles were getting from them. Or John Fogarty, I saw it on TV. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Could any of you compare because every decade there's always a superstar or group that represents that time. Elvis Presley. There was mania then in the 50s when he burst out on the scenes. I know you were a lot younger then. But how would you compare the mania of Elvis to Beatlemania? I mean, we, you know, and, and Al probably know more of me because Al, Al is the elder statesman here. But um, what I remember was, um, you know, I... I started listening to the radio at age two, which would be 57. So I heard a lot of Elvis. Hmm. And I remember Return to Sender was one of my favorite songs, hmm. you know, up during that time frame, 62. And I remember when the Beatles came out, WTIX in New Orleans would say, you know, and, you know, when we were having a listener contest to call us who is better, the Beatles or Elvis. And it was, you know, initially it was Elvis versus the Beatles. And that was a big thing. And by that time, Elvis, you know, was putting out a lot of eh. So it really wasn't a fair <laughs> comparison. The Beatles were putting out all this brilliant stuff. And Elvis is putting out stuff like there's no room to rumba in a convertible or whatever. But, you know, mm -hmm. maybe not from that time. But the point being, you know, Elvis wasn't getting the best songs to put out for the most part. And the Beatles weren't worried about getting songs from other sources because they were writing this tremendous music. And so whenever they had the who was better, I mean, the Beatles would win that hands down, you know, and Elvis was kind of, you know, almost passe at that point in time, you know, and when, a, you know, when a hard day's night comes out, compare a hard day's night to say kissing cousins, mm -hmm. you know, come on folks, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so the Beatles by then, I think Elvis, unfortunately, had become a character of his own self to a certain extent. So you know, we didn't experience, El, you know, Elvis, but the way people who were our age in the 50s would have. Mm -hmm. but you look at film of it, I think the first were really, you know, you could go back, maybe Rudy Valley, and then you certainly have the Bobby Soxes and Frank Sinatra. Then mm -hmm. you have Elvis. Then you have the Beatles. And I remember in high school, I did a paper on, and, and I started mainly with saying, you know, with Sinatra and the Beatles and, um, you know, and started off with, you know, who was going to be, you know, next, who was going to be like this third messiah after Sinatra and the Beatles. And it looked like Elton John might be that person. And for a while he was, but, you know, it, it didn't really, uh, didn't really happen that way. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Uh, Elvis's rise actually was, was somewhat similar uh, to the Beatles rise in England. Mm hmm. Because he had, uh, after, you know, he had re made his first record for Sun in July of '54, and toured around uh, during '54 and '55, 
had uh, you know had a couple of uh, fairly successful uh, country singles, and but Sun Records didn't have the promotional um, wherewithal to to really break him. It wasn't until uh, he was signed to RCA at the end of 1955, and then appeared on the uh, the uh, several appearances on the the Dorsey Brothers stage show early in 56 and then it everything kind of exploded and in fact by the time he appeared on the ed sullivan show in september of 56 he was already a superstar it happened that fast yeah because yes. you know how much i studied the charts and during that sure. period, elvis really the second half of the 50s dominated the charts oh no question Double-sided hits. Most of them were double-sided hits. She couldn't top Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel. Sure. I mean, that kind of... The only thing that... that well, the Beatles topped that. But um, you'd have to say that those were the two biggest singles artists, you know, up through the end of the Beatles' reign. So, right. You know, so that's why I'm asking how would you even compare the two and what the mania was like, because... Elvis obviously attracted so many girls too. Yeah, it wasn't of you know, cool. Of course, Elvis never never toured outside of the uh, outside of the U.S. Thanks, thanks to uh, the Colonel. Sure. <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, so you did. You don't have the scenes of these of this. <laughs> Like Australia, when the Beatles uh, went to Australia in the in late in the spring of '64, and it was like entire cities emptied into the streets. It mm. was, I mean, the, if you see the the film on the uh, you know on the anthology or in other other places, I mean, it's scary looking how big that was. So so really, they kind of eclipsed Elvis's. Um, even even Elvis's peak popularity in fifty six and in fifty seven, and you know, plus the fact that they had 20, 20 number one singles in the U.S. in really six years, right? You know, six six and a half years, and you know, Elvis had a lot of number one records, but he didn't do it in six years. <laughs> the and the other main thing about the the Beatles was the the quality of the songwriting. Yes. And that was the thing that always, you know, was their secret weapon. And in a way, I tell people, it's to a certain extent a shame that they got so good at songwriting so fast because I would have loved for them to have recorded another 20 cover versions because their cover versions are so great on their albums mm -hmm. that, you know, those early albums, I mean, you know, it's not like, oh, well, I, you know, I have to lift the needle because they're doing Please, Mr. Postman. I mean, it was, wow, they do this great. Mm -hmm. but the song, and, and when I interviewed Alan Livingston about the Beatles, uh, when they had gotten a big contract, 67, 68-ish, EMI was just telling Capital, you're crazy paying them that kind of money, and this is nuts. And Alan Livingston said, no, it's not crazy. He said, at Capital... I had the label sign Sinatra when he was supposedly washed up because he had a great voice. He said, and I was always interested in the Beatles because they were great songwriters. And that's, you know, that was really their secret weapon was they were such great songwriters. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. To bounce off what you were saying, Bruce, about the Beatles doing so many great cover versions, that's why I'm so happy that the BBC recordings came out because there are so many songs that are on there that the Beatles didn't end up uh, recording for EMI that they easily could have. They had so many in their arsenal, you know, but they were progressing so much as songwriters at that time that gradually they had to phase out the cover versions. Yeah. You know, they you could tell they had fun doing it. I mean, you know, Capitol Records would say, okay, we're two songs short for rushing out an album and the Beatles, okay, fine. So they go into the studio and knock out, you know, Dizzy Miss Lizzie and, you know, Bad Boy. Bad Boy. And, uh, Thank God we got those two songs. And the thing that I, I was like when I talk about some of their great recordings, the thing about Bad Boy, when you compare it, to, you, well, you take, for instance, you take a song like uh, Slow Down, mm -hmm. and you've got 
you know, the Beatles add something to it, you know, with that, you know, in Dizzy Miss Lizzie in particular, George plays that lead line throughout the song. So they make a Larry Williams song better by addition. Hmm. Bad Boy, they do the opposite. They make a Larry Williams song better by subtraction. Bad Boy has this corny little refrain, you know, he's a bad boy, you know, throughout the song. And so I tell people, if you listen to Bad Boy by Larry Williams, it's a song about a juvenile delinquent. If you listen to Bad Boy by the Beatles, it's about a rock and roll rebel. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the difference between the two. Okay. All right. Um, I want to ask just a, a few questions about that first half of 1964. Um, did the Beatles at the Washington Coliseum and Carnegie Hall get a lot of coverage in the media? Or was it more of a New York thing? Are you aware of... Was everything the Beatles were doing at that moment covered because they were the hottest thing? It's covered locally in the Washington and New York press in very mm -hmm. negative reviews by the music critics. They mm -hmm. savaged the Beatles and uh, you know, very, very insulting. Um, you know, they they didn't get it at that point in time. I really don't think, and one of the things that in working on my current book on a on you know, a hard day's night. I don't think the Beatles really got that adult acceptance until a hard day's night. When all of a sudden, you know, you know, these guys are funny. They're like the Marx brothers and and things like that. And, you know, gee, and I love her. Maybe that's not such a bad song after all, you know, and things like that. So no, uh, you know, they, they got very bad press about those concerts, um, you know. New York Times wasn't terribly kind to the Beatles. Uh, Carnegie Hall show, were they, Alan? Um, I, don't, I, I don't remember the review that well, but it was by John Wilson, who was a jazz critic. The thing is, there were no rock critics. Exactly. There was no, you know, who would have even thought of publishing reviews of, mm -hmm. of rock? So when it came time to cover the Carnegie Hall show, the the closest they could come up with to a pop critic was their jazz critic, John Wilson. Um, and I, I don't remember it being that negative. It might have been. I might have just put that out of my mind. But um, you could tell that he wasn't comfortable, you know, reviewing it. And uh, the thing is that the Times, uh, the one thing I can say for the Times is that they got onto the whole Beatles thing as a cultural phenomenon immediately. I mean, mm -hmm. The February 7th edition of the paper had, I think, three main stories about the Beatles, you know, in, including, uh, you know, the, the uh, a, a psychologist angle. It wasn't Joyce Brothers because she didn't write for the Times, but <laughs> but it was someone like Joyce Brothers, you know, uh, to, to, to try and describe what it was that made girls so hysterical and I don't even think, you know, I get they they only knew girls were going to be hysterical because of what was going on in England because they hadn't been here by February 7th, you know. Um so it was it was it was kind of interesting that that they that they had so much coverage. I think the Times uh, had one of the very first pieces yes. on the Beatles of just the you know the Beatles arrival back from Sweden and you know it the sound was like, you know, jet engines or whatever. And that was just a small little piece, but the thing was, and and I and I look, and I want to preface this by saying, Sid Bernstein was an amazing man. He was a really good guy, full of bad people in that in the music business at times, and you know, and Sid's legend of bringing the Beatles to America is kind of like Sullivan seeing the Beatles, you know, arrive and from Sweden. Yeah. Sid did not bring the Beatles to America. Um, you know, Brian Epstein brought the Beatles to America. Sullivan booked them, you know, prior to that. And, you know, where Sid talked about reading all this stuff in the British press, maybe. But what I really think made Sid Bernstein go, I need to put this group in concert in Carnegie Hall would be a cool place to do it was the New York Times Sunday Times when it had that story on the Beatles around December 1. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think that's when the light bulb really went off in Sid's head because a week or so after that, he runs into, 
you know, this friend of his and starts mentioning it. And it's, you know, and it's in Sid's book. I'm blanking on the guy's name, but he's another unsung hero. He was a promotion man. And uh, I'm sorry, folks, I'm blanking on his name, but he was an unsung hero. Brian hired him when he was in the States in November. And this guy did a lot to promote the Beatles. And he and, um, you know, Sid ran into each other at a deli. And Sid wanted to get Brian's phone number from him to call up Brian. And, and he told him, no, but I'll give Brian your number and see if he'll call you. And he did. And the Carnegie Hall show wasn't officially booked until mid-January. And in all likelihood, that meeting took place probably sometime in late December. So, you know, the all the wonderful star stories you hear about Sid going back a year and all, I don't believe it happened that way. I will not say Sid is a liar. I will merely say that looking back at things many years back, people have a tendency to fall victim to the time compression factor and to get things out of order and things of that nature. But, you know, although I've said I don't agree with what Sid has said, I will tell you, Sid was an extremely important person for the Beatles because he gave them instant credibility. They were in Carnegie Hall, the number one concert venue in the United States because of Sid Bernstein. Mm -hmm. He put him in Shea Stadium and invented, you know, the big outdoor rock concert. Mm -hmm. So Sid was a wonderful man. But I have to be honest, when I when I did the book, The Beatles Are Coming, I originally had written certain things Sid had done. And then when I did my research, I had to go back and completely rewrite it. But a remarkable yeah. guy, and I really feel privileged to have met him several times. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Ken, uh, just to bounce off what you had asked about about the media reaction, yeah. uh, there, was, uh, there was a disc jockey in New York in those days named William B. Williams, mm -hmm. who was on WNEW. Uh, the AM WNEW, which was considered a uh, good music station. Uh, they played Frank Sinatra and Tony Bennett and Lena Horne and Peggy Lee and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. In fact, William B. Williams is the, is the man who, uh, who named Frank Sinatra the chairman of the board. And from, it was like hate at first listen as far as his reaction to the Beatles. Uh, in fact, at one point, he played a few seconds of I Want to Hold Your Hand and said, no, oh, they want to hold your hand. Most people want to hold their noses. And he pretty much had the same attitude toward them the entire their entire run, which was uh, he never warmed up to them at all, Yeah, which was... You know, even 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 with all of the, you know, the developments in their music, you know, nothing. He, sure I mean, it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, was that I think the real first mass acceptance of the Beatle by the, the media was A Hard Day's Night. Yes. And uh, in doing this book, you know, The Beatles, A Hard Day's Night and more, um, I was going through re reviews in the UK, the US and Canada and by and large, extremely positive reviews. There are a few people that put in the negative reviews, but for the most part, really praiseworthy reviews of the Beatles and, you know, and saying that, you know, they have this great talent and hoping they do more films and things and thought that that would be their future. Well, mm -hmm. obviously it wasn't their future. It was still in music, but it did give them a lot of critical acceptance that they hadn't had before. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to say something after what Al said. Yes. Okay. Do you know when I know Leonard Bernstein praised the Beatles? Mm -hmm. Was that mm -hmm. early in 64 or that come a little bit later? Um, he made, a, you know, a few kind of general comments about them. This is when he was still doing the Young People's Concerts. And uh, so he, he made a, a few, you know, generous comments about them. But it wasn't until uh 67 and that cbs uh special on the the new rock where he really came out and you know lavishly praised them but he did he did make some comments before that um mm -hmm. that i believe he i believe he brought his daughters backstage to carnegie uh to meet them yes um, mm -hmm. so, 
so he he clearly saw something there and uh also, um, you know, as the Times continued its coverage, they did a, a little interview with Leopold Stokowski. Yes. Um, where yeah. they asked him about the Beatles. And he basically he basically took the position, you know what, if if they're getting young people to listen to music, so much the better. Mm. You know? So mm -hmm. fairly soon after they came over, certain corners of the older generation was won over, um, and certain corners never were. You know, Mitch Miller. Mitch Miller mm -hmm. ran um, CBS Records or the pop side of CBS Records for uh, basically at that time and for a bit afterwards until Clive Davis, I think, uh, deposed mm -hmm. him. And, and allowed more rock in. Um, but I remember going to a panel in the, you know, mid to late 70s where, you know, he's just railing against the Beatles and, and against all of rock music in general. And he says, um, yeah, I mean, the Beatles, I mean, and all these rock groups, you know, their lyrics have only like two syllable words, never more than two syllables. And I'm thinking, excuse me, I've got no time for trivialities. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, he must have sat under the apple tree with someone else. <laughs> famous reading of Bebop Aluma on nighttime television to show how great these songs are and make fun of them. Mm. Mm. That's now, true. Was it till, if I'm not mistaken, um, till Dion signed with Columbia as a solo act, which was like mm -hmm. at 62 or 63. I mean, well, actually, they had Dylan, but Dylan was more considered, I think, a folky. He was still a folky. Yeah. yeah. Dion was like the first rock artist at Columbia, if I'm not mistaken, signed. And that was like 60. 263 they were uh -huh. the game i guess it's hmm. true yeah okay i just have uh one or two questions left um mm -hmm. what i was curious about is that and believe me i think the beatles were the greatest thing that ever happened in music what people were saying about them was they wrote their own music they played their own instruments you know they were self-contained you had a lot of artists before the Beatles that wrote their own music. You had the Beach Boys, you know, you had uh, Peter, Paul and Mary, you had Bob Dylan, you know, a lot of the 50s rockers, Chuck Berry, Fats Domino, Carl Perkins, Buddy Holly, they wrote their own music. So, mm -hmm. you know, to me, the Beatles were the best there ever was, but it's not like they were the first to do that. What made them stand out for you? when you had all this other music prior to the Beatles, artists who were writing their own stuff and playing their own, their own music, playing their own instruments. I think it was a combination of the, of, of the music, which was, again, as I said earlier, so new and so fresh and so accessible and um, with uh, just the mere fact the top 40 radio began playing album cuts that early in February and March mm. uh, of 64 uh, shows the quality of, of, of their music. Uh, so you have this very new, fresh, uh, extremely accessible music and add to that four very unique personalities. Mm -hmm which was not the case with most of the other groups of that time, including, including the, the British groups, you know, none of them, you know, maybe the who later on, but that was, you know, three or four years later. Uh, but at that point there were, there was no other group that had that, those, the, the, the that, that mixture of, of great music and unique personalities. Hmm. Capital marketed them as John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Yes, uh, because they saw what was happening in England. They even put it on the album covers and on the record labels mm -hmm. where you had the group's name. You know, I have a lot of Kingston Trio records in my collection, but none of them list the members of the group on the labels. None right. of them list them on the covers. They might on the in the liner notes on the back mention who they are. Mm -hmm. But you know, I mean, it was to the point, and it's never changed. 
to, you know, you really wondered what the Vatican was thinking with Pope John Paul because everyone, yeah. oh, Pope John Paul, George and Ringo. You can't miss it. <laughs> there was also, a, you know, the, the visual component is something uh, as well. Mm -hmm. It's very Browsers. interesting. Um, you know, I'd have been reading in, in Deirdre Kelly's book, Fashioning the Beatles, that, you know, I hadn't really thought that. I mean, I, you know, we all thought, okay, they, they do have these interesting suits and the shoes and the hairstyles and all of that. But um, she's really making a point in her book of how all through the Beatles career, um, they were very conscious or maybe at the beginning, Brian was very conscious of how they're being presented and how they're looking. And they looked like nobody else. Nobody was coming out with collarless jackets and high heeled shoes and all of this stuff, uh, at least in America. I mean, maybe in France, you might have had some of that. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the fact that they were so striking visually as well, I think also sort of commanded attention. No, and I think the fact that, you know, to us, we were not in a global community back then. So the fact that they were British, that was really exotic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, you know, and you also had, you know, James Bond at the same time, where all of a sudden you've got all these great British imports, mm -hmm. you know, of James Bond and the Beatles all happening at the same time. I think that helped it. I know for me, the, being British, that was cool to me. The long hair was cool. Mm -hmm. uh, what I loved about the Beatles was the way they could make fun of authority and authority didn't realize they were being made fun in. Mm -hmm. But we were in on the joke. We got it. Yeah. And a hard day's night, you know, was a lot of those things as well. Um, you know, so but the music was also great. What's nice about it is I love being able to look back, you know, 60 years on and say, yeah, I was right when I heard that song on the school bus radio and there was something about it that grabbed me. You know, it wasn't just because everybody else liked them or it was a thing to do. The music was truly great, and it stood the test of time. And you'd see that in some of the columns. Every city had, you know, slice-of-life columnists. And, you know, they would put down the Beatles or whatever. I don't understand the Beatles were in town. How come people are so, you know, they're a flash in the pan. They'll be gone in a month or two. And then mm. you'd get like a girl writing in and saying no. They're really talented. They're going to be around for a long time. And those people were right, of course. They were around for a long time. So it's it's fun to look back and remember the music. I had the same thing happen with the Monkees. You know, I started listening to the Monkees again before the big revivals to see if the music held up. And, of course, it did. Great songwriters, great studio musicians, great vocals, great arrangements. So that music held up well. Iron Butterfly, maybe not so much, you know. Vanilla Fudge, maybe not so much. You know, it sounds a lot more dated. Whereas sure. the Beatles' music does not sound dated at all. Mm -hmm. What about Sam the Sham? <laughs> <laughs> I like Wooly Bully and uh, Little Red Riding Hood, but uh, it's dated. Good, good dated, but dated. Mm -hmm. well, I've often said being dated doesn't affect me at all. If I like the song then, I still like it now. I still love my Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass, and some people think that's the Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look, the dating game was full of their music, and mm -hmm. they did some great stuff. And it, I just, it's hard, though, for me to forgive them for getting record of the year for A Taste of Honey in 1965, considering yeah. all the great music in 1965. Well, blame the It wasn't their fault that happened. You know, I'm sure we can point to a lot of mistakes that they made at the Grammy Awards through the years. Oh, especially back then. Yeah, no question. So back in 1964, and as we all know now in studying the Beatles, they went through so much progression, single to single, album to album. By the end of 64, you've got what was in the UK, Beatles for Sale, Beatles 65 here. Did you noticed this progression that early on when you were that young and did you think because even the beatles themselves said we could be big-headed and last for three years john lennon said it there was always that mindset that every single band was only going to last for a few years and be you know be done by that time did you think this was going to be a lasting band or you you were just going with the flow and enjoying every moment with them 
I think we were pretty much going with the flow. Uh, and that's the, that's one thing that I, that I think we were kind of privileged um, that we were able to, to basically ride the whole, the whole um, career arc of them through that, through that period in the sixties, you know, in real time, you know, younger people have been able to, you know, uh, either they discovered them through the the red and blue albums or kind of cherry picked and said, you know, took one album or another. We were able to kind of enjoy the whole flow. And some people, uh, you know, some people, especially in 65 and 66, when, you know, when they began to really progress musically, some people didn't really like the sitars and psychedelics and things like that. And um, um, it was, at least for me, I was a, I enjoyed the whole ride. Right. Well, that's what Candy Leonard was talking about in Beatleness, that there were a mm -hmm. lot of Beatle fans that felt there was too much change by the time of Rubber Soul and Revolver. Yeah. And that's why they right. gravitated towards the monkeys. Right. Sergeant Pepper was the first one that took you by surprise, as uh, John famously said. Um, but mm -hmm. for me, um, you know, look, I had no idea it was going to progress to what it did because music hadn't gone there. So, you know, what I was saying was that, you know, I didn't know what it was going to progress to because we hadn't had music like that before. So I didn't see it coming at all. Um, it was delightful. And I think the thing that people really miss out on who pick up the Beatles later on is they miss the excitement of that new album coming out. Yeah. Uh, you know, going to the store and, um, you know, taking it home and all of a sudden, you know, you listen to Rubber Soul for the first time in that thrill. If you start with Abbey Road and then your next album is, let's say, Let It Be, and then you get the White Album and you might even forget about the brilliance of those early albums like Meet the Beatles or With the mm -hmm. Beatles. Mm -hmm. And I think, Al, you're right. We were very lucky to have that music real time and have a progression. I think it's not really a progression for people who pick up on the Beatles now and they're deprived of the excitement of what's going to happen next, which is what we yes. began to feel after Pepper, you know, exactly. maybe even after Revolver. What are they going to do to top that? Yeah, and uh, you know, I feel sorry for them missing out on that. But then mm -hmm. again, they've got the brilliant music, so that's the mm -hmm. main thing that counts, isn't it? Right. Absolutely. There's also the thrill of, you know, nowadays we're so spoiled because everything's on the internet at our access, and we can watch whatever we want to. In those days, everything was an event, and you looked forward to it. You know, mm -hmm. you wanted the Beatles to come on the Ed Sullivan Show. You know, those kind of things were really important <laughs> you talked about it the next day in school you know now everything is laid out for you, so you don't appreciate it as much well you can appreciate it as much but it's not as special a moment exactly but it's not built up the way that it was mm -hmm. now, and, and the other thing um that amazed me about it was i saw the beatles do hey jude on the smothers brothers show and i was excited you know, for like, uh, you know, four or five days after I got TV Guide, knowing they were going to be on there. Yeah. yeah. But I saw that show one time until, you know, on that video one time, probably for 20 years. But I could tell you so many things about that video. It literally seared into my mind. Mm, you me know, too. close up on Paul, you know, the reddish purple shirt he's wearing the camera pulls back a little bit ringo's wearing this green jacket everyone comes up on stage oh wait there's an orchestra there's some awkward guy trying to play tambourine i mean all of that stuff seared into my mind forever yet i suspect um you know when i saw a taylor swift video for the first time it didn't sear into my mind like that did hmm. and the anticipation as you say you know, hearing about they're going to be doing this, they're going to be doing that. I remember reading in TV Guide about they played on the rooftop, and it took mm -hmm. a long time for me to actually see that in the theaters. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I knew about it in TV Guide, so that was uh, like over a year I had to wait for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And even on the radio, if they would announce, we've got the new Beatles sing single we're going to play for you tomorrow at 
2 p.m. or something like that, and you waited for it. You know, oh, so I've got a I've got a story about that. Um, I was in, let's say, this would be April of '65. I'm in ninth grade, and uh, it, it, we were going out to uh, out to lunch. It was you know lunch hour, and we would go down to a particular pizza place uh, for a, you know for a slice. And I, and I get out of the, uh, you know, out in front of the school, and there's a bunch of guys gathered around a radio. Now, this is about a year and a half after the assassination of President Kennedy, about two and a half years after the Cuban Missile Crisis. You see a bunch of people ca- gathered around a radio. Oh. There's nothing good that can be going on. Yeah. So, so I went up to one of the guys and I said, I said, what's what's going on? He said, WABC is playing the new Beatles sing, which was Ticket to Ride. Uh-huh. And that shows you the the impact. Absolutely. That just the the debut of a new of a new Beatles record had. And as we as we found out on November second. Yeah. I said in one of one of our shows here in the local record store <laughs> that mm-hmm. I got to, to buy whatever I I feel like in all my Beatles stuff, there was a, a married couple that came in with a little girl. She must have been nine or ten years old. She walked up to the counter and she said, I want the new Beatles single. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It was so cool to hear that. Yeah. Um, it's a little weird was when the you know, proprietor of the store said over there on the classical music section. <laughs> 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 There's one other thing I just want to add here, and that is, and I think you might have said something about this earlier, Bruce. I think that if the Beatles singles, as they were released in the UK, and they were released here on VJ and Swan, um, if they were successful in 63, it would have been exciting. But it was far more exciting the way things turned out when there was an avalanche, (laughs) you know, in January, because we were catching up to everything that was on the Please Please Me album. And then we had the new stuff from with the Beatles. Right. And then we also had new stuff coming in, which would eventually be on a hard day's night all at once. Um, I I think it made it a much more exciting time. I'm really glad it happened the way it did for us in America. mm -hmm. Um, You know, I, I, I agree with that entirely. It was a different experience, of course, but I think a wonderful experience having it all this great music at one time had it just literally explode on us wasn't anything gradual once january hit Mm. and uh you know and when i did the book the beatles are coming i did a little speculative story a what if thing and i was able to license for the fee of zero dollars believe it or not the watcher from marvel because they couldn't figure out what to charge for the watcher because no one had ever wanted to license it and the thing was what if capital had released she loves you in the story I told on it was it was a really horrible thing that everything went horrible for the Beatles because it it was meant to be the way it was. Some exactly. things are just meant to be that way. It was meant to be that CBS expanded their news from 15 mm-hmm. to 30 minutes. It was meant to be that, you know, Walter Cronkite decided to play that story and Marsha Albert, all these things, you know, mm-hmm. all these crazy things had to happen. For the Beatles to explode the way they did in the States. But I'm glad it happened that way. I wouldn't I wouldn't change a thing. I loved I loved experiencing it that way. Everything Amen. just fell into place all at the right time. Mm-hmm. Alan, you want to add anything? No, I think uh I think everyone's covered it pretty well. Um I would just say that, you know, it it was exciting hearing all these new records as they were about to be released and hearing that something was going to be released and getting home and tuning into the, you know, ABC and M- MCA to see who would get it and then, you know, play it over and over. Uh, but, you know, we could hear that there was a progression. I mean, Beatles 65 sounds nothing like the stuff we heard in 64. Oh, Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and I don't think that was lost on us, but um, I, I don't think that we were by then even thinking of them in terms of, yeah, these guys will be around for 50 years. We were just sort of taking it in as it happened. 
But I think once Pepper happened, I think we might have started thinking, you know, <laughs> there's something here. Like, like these guys, unlike a lot of other pop groups, are not going to just suddenly not have a hit and get forgotten because album to album after album, everything changes. Everything is different. Everything is more interesting than the previous one. And the previous one was pretty interesting. And, uh, and I, and I think that after Pepper, we began to sort of think of them a little differently. Um, or at least I think I did, uh, so yeah, that that's the only uh, addition I would make to the, the 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 last few topics that we've that we've covered here. Okay, well, this has been fantastic talking about the Beatles' 60th anniversary of their arrival in the states. We apologize for all the problems we had with Darren's uh, feed, and um, you know, I'm I, he. <laughs> I'm sure he would have wanted to stay all the way through the show, but. Yeah. Um, would you guys like to talk about what you've got going on now? I know Bruce will bring up your latest book, and you already mentioned the new one that you. Yeah, want. I tell people to check out my website, which is very easy. It's just Beatle B E A T L E dot net N E T, and I'm working on you know the last books in the Beatles album series, and then I'll probably take a well deserved break from writing. Um, but I would tell people that the. You know, it was fun doing the later books to match with the box sets. But then I had to go back through the Sea of Time and did, of course, Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine, which is a natural pairing that I do think Apple at some point in time will do. They should do, certainly. Mm -hmm. But when you go back to these early albums, they're brilliant. And when people talk about the Beatles, you know, Abbey Road, Rubber Soul, Revolver, you know, Sgt. Pepper, the White Album, rightfully so. But don't neglect these great early albums. They are fantastic albums in their own way. And, you know, I urge people to, you know, go out and, and get these books because it will put things in context. Al Sussman has written some brilliant stuff on what else was going on musically at the time, what was going on in the world at the time. And I think having that stuff placed in concept, uh, you know, I'm a, obviously a big music fan. But I view myself also as a historian. I used to love taking history courses in school. And um, it's been fun doing this series of books because I'm able to, you know, bring in what was going on in the world. And it's a lot of fun. And I, I think people will really get a kick out of those first two books. If you if you didn't get Please Please Me to With the Beatles because it wasn't about Rubber Soul or whatever, trust me, buy the book, you'll enjoy it. And buy the Hard Day's Night book, you'll be amazed at the incredible music the Beatles did, and it'll really bring home, you know, what happened in 64 for us, because there was so much great Beatles music that we had to catch up on, and we did. And oh, yeah, they made this little film, A Hard Day's Night. <laughs> it's so amazing to think what they went through at that time when they barely had a day off, you know, yeah. which recording or performing live somewhere or a BBC performance or... They were always so busy and somehow through it all they came up with all this incredible music and such high quality music constantly so al how about you you were talking about beetle fan there's a new issue that's uh right yeah. uh, exactly and first of all just want to thank bruce for the kind words uh but yes there's a brand new issue of beetle fan out uh <laughs> some people have it <laughs> Bruce and Alan have it. I don't. I don't have my copy yet. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, I have a. I have a piece in um, uh, in this issue about uh, a lot of uh, at least some of what we've been uh, talking about uh, here tonight. And uh, and then I've got a piece coming up in the next issue on what I consider, you know, the greatest occurrence in the history of the pop music charts. And that's of course the April 4th, 1964 mm -hmm. uh, billboard uh, top five uh, of the Beatles having the, the top five singles and the top two albums. And the mm -hmm. top five singles in cash box. And the top five singles in cash box. Exactly. Okay. That's and the, and the top, three or four singles on any number of radio stations around the country at that time. And that week, didn't they have something like 14 songs in the hot 100? Something, something like, that. like that. Yeah. 
Including Canadian import singles, yeah. Right. Inclu yeah, exactly. Um, as for me, on my YouTube channel, I did an interview recently with Madeline Baccaro, who wrote that wonderful book on Yoko Ono. Um, we did a show which I thought would be a good idea for Yoko's birthday. She just turned 91 years old, um, in which uh, Madeline shared with us five songs of John's that were favorites of Yoko's, and then five songs of Yoko's that were favorites of John's. So we talk about that in the show. We also did an interview with Glenn Burtnick and Bob Berger of The Weaklings. They have their brand new CD out called Raspberry Park, which you can win on my website, on my uh beatles trivia contest and i also uh, did an interview with steve matteo who we mentioned before uh darren mentioned him has his new book called act naturally covering all five of the beatles films you can win a copy of that book on my website kenmichaelsradio.com with my beatles trivia um talk more talk the other beatles podcast that i co-host it's a solo beatles podcast uh, there is a show that uh, was posted recently. It was our panel from the Fest for Beatles fans talking about the year 1974 in review. And um, if you want to listen to my uh, syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, um, you can go to WFDU's website where they run or they, they post uh, the last two shows that aired on the radio station in their archives. And you can listen on demand. And that's at WFDU.FM. And that's basically it. Alan? Okay. Um, you can find me on Facebook, either under Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you'll want to check out our new Things We Said Today page on Facebook. Um, if you are watching this on YouTube, you will have noticed the opening logo is different. It's, uh, Darren created a new logo for us. Um, we're using the same music, which is by Michael Lynch, because he wrote it for us and recorded it for us. So uh, now we have a, a, a custom-made song and a custom-made logo, and uh, the, the new logo is also on the new Facebook page, which Darren put together. Um, Sorry about all of the glitches. I disappeared for a bit. Darren's disappeared a number of times. Um, but since Darren's not here, I'll, I'll just give you some of his information. Um, he can be heard at WFUV-FM, which is at 90.7 in the New York area. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else um, at WFUV at WFUV.org. In the information section uh, on YouTube and also Podbean and I guess some of the other places that carry us, there is all the contact information for all of us. And I believe it gives the hours of Darren's shows as well, which I haven't written down. But um, you can um, you can contact all of us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed, which is at Things We Said Fab. And um, I think that's about it. And all that information is actually in our description box. That's right. That's that's what I was saying. <laughs> so it was great having Al and Bruce and Darren when he was here. <laughs> right. And, um, so for Ken Michaels and for Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.